great dinosaur who saved us from the American forces, we would all be dead.
now recognize that birds are dinosaurs, what I study is the long, deep evolution of birds from Mesozoic dinosaurs. The very concept is unimaginable. Why, if that happened, we wouldn't have a chance. How could we possibly hope to fight them? We couldn't, you're right. You're right, Mrs. Bundy. Hurry up, children, finish your lunch. Are the birds going to eat us, Mommy? Birds have been on this planet since Archaeopteryx, 140 million years ago. Doesn't it seem odd that they'd wait all that time to start a, a war? Who said anything about a war? All I said is... Troodon probably fed on our ancestors, the early mammals. It is the most intelligent, adaptable, and successful hunter on the planet. You gotta check your mirrors, just side of your eye. Side of your eye. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's really good to have you here. Man, does it feel good for me to be back. I was gone on hiatus, exiled for a few days, and now I'm back. So welcome back to Paleontologizing. That's how dinosaurs are. Unpredictable. It's true. It is true. Holy cow, Feist, thank you so much for the 25 months of support. That is stellar. It really is. That is as wonderful and as uh, long-lived as I am looking red right now. Shoot, I don't know what happened, but this when I restarted the computer, to becoming a fossil. might be on my way to do this. Step one, die. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> 14 months. Thank you, thank you, Tommy Platicus. No, he looks fossil. Uh, four months from Tommy Platicus there. Fourteen months from Helix Fossil. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Shoot. Let me uh, try and de-red myself here real quick. For whatever reason, the camera got reset. So let's go ahead and configure the video on this. Gonna do this live, you know? Uh, we're gonna take our hue. 
and we are going to go to there. That's better. Yeah. I don't know why it specifically reset the hue and nothing else. But now we're all good again. Let's check on our 3D printer camera. That's looking peachy keen. So far, the print has not failed. That's good. That's good. And, uh... Camera's looking good also. Nice. See, so yeah, I leave for a few days and, like, stuff just falls apart. I checked all this beforehand, too, and it... Anyway. If it's anybody's very first time here, then an extra special welcome to you. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And here on this Twitch channel, Paleontologizing... I like to think it delivers what it promises. We do paleontology. We talk about new discoveries, new publications in fossil science. I go over some of my work and the work of my colleagues. We talk about what's new in paleontology. We talk about how it works. The whole point is to give you an inside look into how fossil science goes down. Whether it's field work, whether it's research, whether it's outreach like I'm doing here. Uh work in museums, any of that good stuff, you know? And I do all that stuff, by the way. I go out and dig up dinosaurs with various museums across the American West. I study dinosaurs, I publish on them in the scientific literature, and nowadays, believe it or not, I make my living talking to you good folks, usually five days a week. This week I had a three-day hiatus right in the middle. Well, yeah. Call me the world's first full-time live-streaming paleontologist. Um, I'm really excited to work more on my Spinosaur manuscript on Sunday. Got to get that thing submitted for publication before I leave for the field and before I go to a conference in uh, Utah at the beginning of June. So clock's ticking. I'm going to be working on that, but we'll also be streaming tomorrow. An extra special Saturday stream. Very much out of the ordinary on Saturday. Uh, to try and make up for the three days that I missed earlier this week. So, uh, I hope you can make it to that. I'll tell you more about our special Saturday stream plans in a little bit. But for right now, Mastrictian, I'm going to the top of chat, and some of them are already gone. A lot of chats were already gone. Shoot. But Mastrictian, Golganek, Dr. Javasaurus, Claire Burr, uh, the Lenina, <clears throat> Creatrix Brit, Fossil Vet. Welcome back, Fossil Vet. Good to see you. Uh, Charlie Rex, go for Fluffernut. Uh, Matt M33, we've got so many wonderful people here already. Holy cow. Uh, give them Nell, El Bacala, Kodali, Admanta. How are you doing, Admanta? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. A free Steam game about trilobites, Admanta? That sounds really cool. Somebody contact Admanta about that. Zintaus, 18 months of support from you. Thank you, thank you for that, Zintaus. Appreciate you, Zin. Thank you for keeping me here on the air. Well, we've already got four out of 60. We are one fifteenth of the way to our sub goal for the day. Uh, I had to set the sub goals a little bit higher to sustain myself for this week since there are fewer streams. But yeah. All right, scrolling down, Duck Admirer, the Eternal. How are you doing, Eternal? Thank you, thank you, by the way, for upgrading your Prime to a recurring sub. Now your subscription is as eternal as your name is. In the sense that if you went to cancel it, then it would be done. <laughs> but it's you didn't do that. You made it ongoing. A living, breathing thing. Thank you, Eternal. I appreciate you. Uh, MS Coggins. How are you doing, MS Coggins? Welcome, welcome. It's great to see you. Uh, Nafron. Howdy, howdy. Hope things are going with you. Na I hope things are going well with you, Nafron. Not just that they're going, I hope they're going well. And, uh, and Admanta, it helps. You know, interesting. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying yourself, Admanta. Rob Sui, how are you doing? Hello to you too. Welcome, welcome. The other Caliban, hello to you. And to, uh, the other, other Caliban too. Whether or not they're watching. Caliban, I, jokes aside, I appreciate you being here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Tommy Plotticus is here too. How are you doing, Tommy Plotticus? Thank you for the four months of support once again. Appreciate you. Esther the Dreamer, ciao to you too. Is ciao is like aloha, isn't it? It can mean hello or goodbye. Right? 
in my mind, Chao is much more associated with goodbye than it is with hello. Almost like a synonym for, like, sayonara that somebody would say in a sarcastic way. That's my crass American mindset, I suppose. But, uh, Esther the Dreamer, ciao to you too. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for joining us here on Paleontologizing today. I'm glad you could be here. Welcome back. Uh, who else did we have? Uh, Jenny ACW. How are you doing, Jenny? Welcome. Welcome. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, but let's see. And Rex says, talked with Jim. Uh... Yeah, and Rex, I, yeah, I don't know, you, yeah, yeah, Rex, maybe send me another DM, and we'll talk, <laughs> and holy cow, who is this, Nebraska Farmer, holy cow, Farmer is getting serious with those five gift subs. Yes, indeed, Nebraska Farmer. I really appreciate those five gift subs. Thank you. Thank you for that. Holy moly. That is extraordinary, Nebraska Farmer. Thank you. There are now five people in chat who will no longer have to watch any ads on this channel for the next 30 days. Uh, that's like almost until I leave for the, for the field. Um, that's a long time, and that's generous of you, Nebraska Farmer, and I appreciate you. Thank you for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. Seriously. Um, I could not do this, uh, if it were not for the generous support of viewers like you. So, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah! And Feist has got any digging upcoming? Holy cow. Potentially June, July, August. Maybe into September. I got to talk to some people. I'm, I might have like three straight months worth of field work this summer. Maybe four months. And right now I, I'm trying to be able to live stream it. But I am fighting with Starlink right now. Let's see if they've gotten back to me. Um, but it's been, yeah, it's been a whole week and I've not heard a peep from them. I'm starting to feel like I'm getting scammed here, but we'll see. We will see. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'll talk more about that later, and it's but I got to get through chat. We're here today because... By the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. Thank you, a truck horn, for helping me prevent being felled by mass extinction or lack of funds. Appreciate you, truck horn. Thanks for keeping me from going extinct through your generous support. I appreciate you, truck horn. 11 months at tier two right there. That means you get to use the hammer emote, right, Trekhorn? Most folks don't have the uh, the paleo hammer emote. Associated with fieldwork. There it goes right there. See it? So, there's another one. Here's another one. Ah. I couldn't bite it. Here's, here's one. Mmm. That's some tasty field implements there. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh... Yeah. Excellent. Forged steel. Uh, I don't know if Estwing hammers actually are forged steel, but yeah. Uh, Eternal says, what's printing today? Let me show you, Eternal. This is part of our life-size Allosaurus skull. Um, and big, sh big, uh, big thank you to Majot. For gifting me some more 3D printer filament. We're printing this thing life-size. Allosaurus, the state fossil for the state of Utah. The most common large theropod in the Morrison Formation, late Jurassic of North America. Sometimes called the Lion of the Jurassic. If you want to get all corny like that. Allosaurus. Full-size skull. 
Uh, this sucker's gonna be like a meter long. Really big. Really big. And uh, I'm printing the lower jaw first, because that'll be the first part to finish, and then I can show it off. But, um, yeah, so the part that's printing right now... Here's an apple for scale. It's part of this lower jaw. I think it's one of these bones toward the back, behind the dentary. Yeah, but very excited about that. It'll be a wonderful addition to our menagerie of 3D printed dinosaur fossil elements. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Uh, but let's see here. I'm pretty sure that the Dilophosaurus has gotten a big smile, says Zin. Yeah, I attached the lower jaw to my Dilophosaurus here a while ago. That's another big skull. Because of Jurassic Park, people don't realize how big Dilophosaurus was, but that's a, that's a big animal. Dilophosaurus might have been... At the time that it lived... It's one of the largest meat-eating dinosaurs around. Yeah. Um, there you go. I love this image here. This is beautiful. Just, wow. Chef's kiss. There's the Jurassic Park Dilophosaurus, and then there's actual Dilophosaurus there. Much larger. And we only have, like, three specimens of this animal. The largest one is about that size, they may have gotten even larger than that. I mean, shoot. We do not have many data points for this creature. We'll be talking about this sort of thing, especially with theropod dinosaurs today, as we talk about T-Rex also. So, uh, yeah. Why having more specimens is a wonderful thing. Because you can do so much more science with them. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, scrolling down, scrolling down, trying to catch up. Uh, mail call today. I didn't have a chance to go to the post office, Creatrix, but I just got back from, uh, from my travels. But, uh, did you send me something, Brit? Holy cow. We'll have to check the P.O. box. Gotta do that soon. Gotta do that soon. Yeah. And it's actually Venetian dialect that got popular. Is that right, Eternal? Huh. Chow is, uh, is Venetian. What are the odds that Nebraska farmer happens to grow corn? I mean, corn or maybe, aren't soybeans becoming increasingly subsidized as well? Um, could be soybeans too. Yeah. Um, but scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. And you do have a big smile, Delafo Mesnors. How you doing, Delafo? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, formidable animal. If anybody wants to have like a... Oh, yeah, shoot. Here we go. This is lovely. <laughs> ah, from the venerable Scientific American, we have this. Uh, Brannington. Holy cow. Hold the phone. Thank you, Brannington, for the four months of support. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I don't know why she uh, chose to spell it out that way, but Brannington, thank you so much for the four months of support. I really do appreciate that. Thank you for keeping me here on the air for four straight months now. It's a long time. I appreciate you. Thank you for for choosing to uh, to use those primes on this channel. No, you only get one of those per month, so thank you. Seriously. Yeah. The real Dilophosaurus would have eaten the Jurassic Park version for breakfast. Uh, the most comprehensive study of the iconic dinosaur reveals a very different animal from the one portrayed on film. Excellent. Uh, article here. I actually need to read this in full. Let's embiggen this part. Yeah, portrait of a predator. Uh, um, yeah, there you go. Dilophosaurus. Really, really cool animal. And if you'd like to watch a really excellent video produced by one of the people involved in that study. Eng Dilophosaurus. Here we go. A modern look at Dilophosaurus. I show this off all the time. But, um... The Lophosaurus isn't closely related 
to any of these animals. Yeah. Instead, it forms a strange grade of theropods, along with Zupiosaurus from South America yep. and Cryolophosaurus from Antarctica. From Antarctica. And none of these dinosaurs were direct ancestors to the ceratosaurs or megalosaurs of the late Jurassic. Yeah. Anyway, really, really cool stuff. This is by Brian Eng, and he actually goes through, looks at the original fossil material of Dilophosaurus, some of which I got to work on back at Berkeley. Holy cow, that crest is incredibly thin. It's like a potato chip. Just it made me super, super nervous. And there's the hand of uh, Dr. Patricia A. Holroyd, my uh, my mentor in Berkeley when I was there in high school. Um, but yeah, here is a link to that video. Check it out. Uh, you will not find a better Dilophosaurus video anywhere on the internet. Um, excellent stuff. Oh, and here's a link to that, uh, that article, too, about Dilophosaurus. What a cool dinosaur, and how incredibly misunderstood is this critter, you know? Yeah. And would the crest have been very brittle when the animal was alive? No, Eternal. You should watch the video to find out why. We would watch it now, but we've got so much stuff to get to on this stream. I'm trying to stay focused here. Um... Yeah. Yeah, and we've man, we've taken a look at that so many times in the past. Um got to stay on target. Stay on target. Um Yeah. Let's uh Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to get to now. Let's protect our fossils because if they're removed, America loses them. Forever. And Helix Fossil, thank you for converting from a Prime to a Tier 1 sub right there, Helix Fossil. Thank you, thank you. That is a recurring subscription, and I am deeply grateful for it. Thank you, Helix Fossil. Thank you very, very much. Excellent. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And Mayor of Space, I, I, w I was monitored while I was working on that mayor of space. I was, and I was definitely not in charge of that project to work on the holotype or paratype skull of Dilophosaurus. Holy cow. Yeah. Anyway. Let's get to our stream topic for the day, shall we? There's some things that I promised. Would be powerless before the onslaught of, the beast. of the what? The beast. I'm sorry. The what? The beast. I didn't catch that. The beast. Again? The, beast. the what? The beast. I, I'm sorry. You'll have to say it one more time. Ah, uh, shoot. The dinosaur grow some more now that it's a year old. Thank you, Daikaiju, for the 12 months of support. I do really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Daikaiju. Good stuff. And a Raidosaurus. There you go, Daikaiju. See? Daikaiju knows what's up. <laughs> Ah, yeah. All right, so. What are we talking about today? Oh, boy. I paint burbs. Holy moly. Thank you so much for the raid. And look, we've got a whole bevy of birds there. Thank you. Thank you, I paint burbs, for the raid. I really appreciate that. Um... Welcome. This is exquisite. We're going to have a lot of alerts here, I think. Look at all the wonderful people who just just followed. Well, welcome, everybody. If it's your very first time here, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. So you probably know already, given that you are very clever viewers, you watch I Paint Burbs. You are... You're the creme de la creme of, uh, of Twitch viewers there you are. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologists. We're not used to getting this many follows in such a short time. Um, I think dinosaurs are put together correctly. The bones. Mm. You're smart. What Fair do you question. think? Anyway, birds are indeed dinosaurs. Never, 
the extinction of dinosaurs is the absolute prerequisite to the evolution. And we talk about that all the time here to our own existence on the stream. If you've got questions about that, every bone that we find tells us something. I've got about answers for you. Was. Let me show you something real quick, though. Somebody type in exclamation mark turkey. Up front. Try not to go extinct. Uh, chat is really moving at a fantastic clip, but let's get another uh, shout out real quick for I Paint Burbs, one of my favorite channels here on Twitch. Holy moly. A very talented artist who really knows her birds, her modern dinosaurs. Um, it's an honor to be raided by you. I really appreciate it. And uh, if anybody watching me before the raid is not yet following I Paint Burbs, you're missing out. There's my old boss, Jack Horner, right there. Holy cow, this is a ton of follows, and I am deeply grateful. Shoot. Uh, check this out. And thank you, Lenina. And if you, uh, if you type an exclama exclamation mark turkey into chat, uh, here's an infographic that I put together a couple Thanksgivings ago. Uh, you can print this out. You can share it with your friends and family. Turkeys aren't just dinosaurs, but all living birds are descended from two-legged, meat-eating, feathered dinosaurs. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is basically an infographic to try and explain all of the different dinosaurian features that birds inherited. Most of the things that make birds really special, birds like this Tinamu right here, who's quite excited about those 10 gift subs from Murph. Beautiful Tinamu bird from South America. Uh-oh. I don't know if this one is rated for that many subs, actually. You might want to take cover here. This doesn't look good. Shoot! Murph is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Murph, thank you, thank you. For those 10 gift subs there. I really appreciate that. Holy cow. Interested in your island. It's got nothing to do with oil. I'm a paleontologist. Uh, holy moly. Um, finally, I think our alerts are over. This is a dinosaur. Almost. And this is a dinosaur too. Thank you to everybody who followed. I don't... Eddie Cosmo, Interstellar, Dice, Ash Husky, Kyrie Elsie, Alpha Thorn Omega, Flea. So many, too many people to mention almost. But I appreciate each and every one of you. Um... Holy cow. I Paint Burbs, thank you again for that phenomenal raid. Let's get one more shout out for I Paint Burbs. Oh, we just had one. Overdoing it here, but my heart is full. Thank you, I Paint Burbs. Again, my name is Danny. I'm a paleontologist. I dig up dinosaurs across the American West with various museums. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. Right now, I'm working on a publication on these guys. This is a, uh, a Spinosaurid. Spinosaurids were these bizarre, crocodile-snouted, big, beefy-armed, large-clawed theropod dinosaurs that ate fish. I'm actually in a project that I'm working to get published over the next two months. Next month, actually. Running up against a deadline here. I'm comparing these guys against modern fish-eating animals, including a lot of birds, looking at similarities and differences between creatures like Spinosaurids and, say, herons, shoebills, kingfishers, um, different birds like that. The present really can be a key to the past, and vice versa. And that's a big part of what I do as a paleontologist, is comparing the anatomy and behavior of modern animals to that of extinct animals. Trying to draw behavioral inferences for the morphology of living animals. Anyway, a lot of this stuff is explained in a quick little video that I've got for you here. So, uh, for all of you who are new, I'm gonna introduce you to somebody we like to call Previously Recorded Danny. And thank you, Buzzy Mix, for that follow there. Appreciate it. Previously Recorded Danny is, uh, he's a good friend of ours here, and, uh, he likes to welcome in new people to the channel. So without further ado, we will let him take things away. Thank you again, I paint burbs. Buckle in, everybody. Here comes previously recorded Danny. He's actually stinking up behind me right now. So, um, 
we'll let him take center stage. Previously recorded, Danny. It's your time to shine. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies and the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work. Wait, hey, hang on a second. We're getting another raid here. Sorry to interrupt previously recorded Danny. I'm sorry, previously recorded Danny. But we're getting another raid here. Real life fiasco. Thank you so much for raiding in. How did your stream go? And welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Here, we can, uh, we can pick that up in a second. But yeah, Mega Mumu, what a huge day indeed. And, this is a dinosaur too. and thank you, uh, Little Nerd, K. Lukes, and Brian Fritch for the follows. Really appreciate those. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Game of paleontology. Yeah. Much larger mysteries still remain. It was delightful. You did some just chatting. What did you, uh, what did you just chat about? I would love to hear about it, real life. I would love to hear about it. Yeah. And we crunchy. You sound delicious, little nerd. I appreciate you being here. Shoot, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. So again, a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. I dig up dinosaurs, I study them, I publish on them in the scientific literature. And now, five days a week, usually five days a week, I missed some days this week, which is rare, but usually five days a week, I'm here on Twitch talking to all of you good folks about fossil science, trying to give you an inside peek into how paleontology works. And since I specialize in dinosaurs, we talk about dinosaurs a lot, like a lot, like a, a lot, a lot. It's mostly dinosaurs, but, um, yeah, but if you're curious about mammoths, about plicosaurs like Dimetrodon or fishapods like TikTok, whatever, whatever kinds of fossil critters you're interested in, hopefully I can point you in the right direction to learn more about them and say some cool things about them too. But my real specialty is dinosaurs, and I try and make that very clear. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I dig up, what I publish on. And that's really the only topic I can speak on with any kind of real authority. But yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, new raiders who came in with real life fiasco. Uh, yeah. Real life fiasco says it's amazing to watch you grow. I came around right when you started streaming full time. Well, thank you, real life fiasco. I appreciate you. Welcome back. Yeah. Um, I guess this was kind of an open niche. I'm the world's first full-time live-streaming paleontologist, Let's I guess. Our fossils, because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Little Nerd 05, thank you very, very much for subscribing. I really appreciate that. The only reason I can do this full-time... <laughs> In all the world, there are fewer than four um, full-time dinosaur paleontologists. 
And five gift subs from Little Nerd. Holy moly. Our leading Little Nerd, big gift. Big generosity there. Thank you for helping feed this paleontologist here. Nerd 05 just gifted five subs. I really appreciate that. I really, really do. A real mean Holy moly. And you're a scam baiter. Oh, that's awesome, real life fiasco. That's doing some good work. Thank you for doing what you do, and thank you for bringing your raiders here. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. Shoot, we were, uh, we were just watching, uh, well, we were conversing with our friend previously recorded Danny, who likes to, uh, I don't know, to introduce new folks to the stream. So let's go ahead and get back to him, shall we? Yeah, um, previously recorded Danny, are you still there? Yeah, he's still there. He he likes to hang out over there. Um, go ahead and uh, once you start from the top and introduce all these new folks, go for it. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm gonna level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. But how in the world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy Alan Grant was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country. A dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspices of Jack Horner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of field work in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, at fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Triarchunchus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives and help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. 
But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. Oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed. Where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover for to strike the whole world amazed. Home, home, home on, on the range, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you, and I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. To everybody who's new, welcome. Genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and uh, be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day, Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to our magnificent raiders. I paint burbs and real life fiasco for bringing all of these cool new wonderful folks into the stream <clears throat> let me know if you've got any questions um see this is the beauty of a live broadcast like this is uh you never know who's going to show up what questions they might have and how your uh your plans for a stream might go awry because of those occurrences so yeah yeah it's got to roll with the punches and uh, and do that. But yes, as the moderators Lenina and Claire Burr were saying, those videos that I with previously recorded Danny, those are actually from a couple years ago. A lot has changed since then, and uh, I've not had an opportunity to really make any new videos since then. I've been too busy with science and with doing other stuff on stream. Yeah, scientist work is never done, you know. <laughs> and it takes a lot of editing to make those videos. But yeah, I now do this full-time. This is my full-time gig now, which is phenomenal. Unlike most young researchers that I know who have to spend the majority of their time either teaching classes or writing grant proposals, sometimes writing grant proposals for like 35 hours every week, I'm funded entirely through viewer support that funds my research, my fieldwork, and my science outreach. That is my science outreach, you know? So yeah. Welcome to Paleontologizing. And uh, thank you for watching. By the way, update. I don't remember if previously recorded Danny said anything about fieldwork or not being able to do fieldwork back in 2020. But I've been doing fieldwork since then. Uh, I did a bunch of fieldwork last summer. I will be doing a crazy amount of fieldwork this summer. Going out into the badlands of Wyoming and Utah, digging up dinosaur fossils, and cross your fingers. If things go according to plan, I'll be able to, to stream that. Nega Oryx! Holy moly. It's just one raid after another. And look, we've got a dinosaur playing the drums. 
you know, a modern dinosaur. But good stuff. <laughs> it's it's a rate it appears to be waving. And uh Pegasus says Welcome everybody. Gorex is bringing the beat along with their 101 raiders. Holy moly, welcome everybody to paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza, I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I've been overcome with raids today. <clears throat> I stream fossil science usually every weekday here on Twitch. So if you've got questions about dinosaurs, my particular area of research and interest, <clears throat> Or if you've got questions about natural history, about extinction, evolution, broader topics in uh, in natural history, whatever, you know, I'm here to answer those for you and to give you an inside peek into how paleontology works. You know, I firmly believe that our world would be a better place if more scientists had the opportunity to reach out to the public, talk to them about science, <laughs> and amaze them with... Uh, what we found. Um, thank you, Steepy Peepy Waving, Duke Sixty, and Dragon Fairy for your follows. I appreciate all of you. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Yeah, I was just mentioning how this summer I'm hoping to be able to to actually live stream my field work, to bring you along for the ride as I'm out there digging dinosaurs in Wyoming and in Eastern Utah. I'm currently uh, wrestling, fighting with, feuding with, I don't know. Starlink has not been kind to me. I kind of fear that their, uh, their customer service staff may have been on board that rocket that exploded over the past couple days. Because I've not heard from back from them in a week, and my equipment is not working, and uh, that's what I was going to use to get internet out in the middle of nowhere. So we'll see. We'll see. But if it works, I'll be live streaming field work this summer and you will get to see what a dinosaur dig is like live here on Twitch. Like live Twitch dinosaur dig. It's I think that's going to be a first. And I'm excited about it. And uh I hope you can come along for the ride. Even if Starlink doesn't work, which is looking increasingly likely. I might be able to figure something out for Wyoming using cellular data. So we'll have something at least. But yeah. Yeah. Science. What science ever done for us? TV off. And thank you, the King of Nerds, for the follow. Uh, King of Nerds says, okay, listen, do you know how many people love dinosaurs in Nega Oryx's channel? We have an intentionally goofy version of the Jurassic Park theme with an accordion. That is beautiful, King of Nerds and Nega Oryx. Uh, that is really lovely. Well, welcome to Paleontologizing. You will all feel right at home here, I hope. I do my darndest to try and make this as welcoming a community as I can for as many people as I can. And uh, yeah, we're going to be going over some fossil news in a little bit. But before we do that, we've got a bunch of new people here. Um. So, uh, I think we might need another visit from previously recorded Danny to kind of introduce some new folks to the channel. This will be the, the video that we, uh, we cut off like 20 seconds into Certainly there are many when we got that second raid. To be many anyway, Coffee Moon. Waiting to be Thank you for that follow, Coffee Moon. I appreciate you. Welcome, welcome. And you know what? Legend has it. But the paleontologist field isn't narrow to what we understand. On the contrary, oh. we stretch our understanding to try and take in the universe. It's true, Scarlet Eve. Thank you for the follow. Legend has it that if there are a bunch of new people in chat, game of paleontology. and if the music stops like it has right now, then previously recorded Danny might make an appearance. And if there are enough number ones that get typed into the chat, previously recorded Danny might materialize in a new video that we have... Well, I could play one that we haven't seen yet today. 
creatures you might think of as inhabiting another planet. Or the kind you dream of. Spartan, thank you. For the 32 months of support, I appreciate that. He's standing right behind me. Spartan. Without further ado, we're going to let him take the floor. Uh, previously recorded Danny, it's your time now. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell you. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working in the paleo lab at Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you're more familiar with that institution and with my old boss than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of field work, digging at hundreds of sites in the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Gasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader, Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen, the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy. Truarchuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs. But I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana. So I packed up and moved back to the West Coast. And I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended, and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jumps or Archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids who want to see them lining up at a museum. 
am whole paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am whole paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. Having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Dan. And of course, thank you even more to Nega Oryx for that remarkable raid. I really appreciate it. Look at that graph. Cloud Sage, this is a good graph. Thank you for uh, for showing it, and thank you for following. And a random Tim, thank you for following earlier, five minutes ago. Appreciate you. Thank you, Nega Oryx, for that remarkable raid. If anybody's got any questions about... Dinosaurs in particular, because that's actually what I work on. Or about other topics in natural history. Extinction, evolution, the history of life on Earth, the philosophy of science, any of that stuff. Um, you let me know, okay? Before we get into our fossil news topics for the day. Uh, J and JC Extra, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. So, yeah. Yeah. Little Nerd says Darwin was right. I mean, about a lot of things. Darwin was wrong about a few things. Darwin didn't know anything about genetics. His DNA hadn't been discovered yet. Heredity was kind of unknown at the time, but like, it's kind of amazing the things that Darwin was correct about way back before many of these biological processes were well understood at all. But was he right about evolution being a thing? That living things change over time? Yes. It was 100% correct about that. And this has been... It's kind of crazy, because Darwin made some pretty bold claims uh, during his lifetime. Back in the late 1800s. Mid to late 1800s, you know, about living things changing over time. And you know what? There are a zillion places where he could have been proven wrong with new discoveries from the fossil record, from genetics, from, you know, biogeography, from a zillion other fields. And again, and again, and again. The scientist, long after he died, found that he was right about a lot of this stuff. Like, most of this stuff. Which is pretty cool, you know? Um... That's the mark of a good scientist, is you make predictions, you put yourself out there, you put these precious, precious ideas that you have, they're like, they're like children, they're like babies. You put them out there into the world and other scientists try to tear them apart, and if they can't, well shoot, it's because they're probably true. That's what happened with Darwin. So yeah, yeah. Um... But yeah, yeah. I can I talk about the Spinosaurus thing? Not quite yet, Interstellar Dice. Not quite yet. Shoot, I I will be able to talk about it in the fall, I think, when I get back from fieldwork this summer. And you'll see it in the news, hopefully. We want to go big with the press on this, but yeah. 
Spinosaurids, these very cool fish-eating dinosaurs. But I'm turning into a dinosaur. Dark Tarkanis, what a dramatic transformation. Thank you for the 26 months of support there, Dark Tarkanis. You might have been the first one to ever trigger that new alert. Good for you. So yeah, yeah. I know publishing takes approximately forever. Exactly, Interstellar Dice, exactly. See, Dice gets it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And man, I've got some other stuff coming up too, though. Uh, new insights on some armored dinosaurs. Hopefully that'll be published this year, we'll have to see. But yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, I think, and, uh, Existential Crisis, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Yeah, we, we do have, when we get this many fantastic, amazing raids all in a short span of time, there's a little video that I like to show, not a previously recorded Danny video. Another video really? that I like to show off. No the underscore paid underscore actor gifted a tier one sub to uh, Thank you. Dice. Thank you, paid actor. First gift sub in the channel. I really appreciate that, paid actor. Thank you. Thank you for that. That is exquisite. And look, holy cow, we're already halfway to our sub goal for the day. And this sub goal was a long shot. I didn't stream for three days earlier this week because I was on, I was traveling. I was on a trip. Um, trying to make up for that with this very lofty sub goal for the day. Thank you, paid actor, for gifting Interstellar Dice. I appreciate you. Thank you for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. Here, I, uh, since we've got so many cool new people here, before we get to any of our fossil news, why don't I show you this video? This is a video from... The esteemed 60 Minutes news magazine show from the Central Broadcasting Station, CBS. I can spare no expense. Here in the United the States. King of the Nerds gifted a tier one sub to Luna and Thank you, King of the Nerds. First gift sub in the channel. Seriously. Thank you, King of the Nerds. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. This is my old museum where I used to work in Montana, Museum of the Rockies. There's my old boss, Jack Horner. You saw him in the welcome videos. There's actually a few clips from, from those welcome videos in here. But this is going to blow your mind, I guarantee it. We've still got a bunch of bird people in from I Paint Burbs, right? Uh, type a three into chat if you are still here from the I Paint Burbs raid. I want to I wanna see uh, if you are still here because this has everything to do with birds. Or burbs, as it were. Sarah Blam, thank you. McPickle Interstellar Dice. Yes. Yeah. So if you'd like to learn about the process of potentially kind of back engineering a bird into one of its dinosaurian ancestors or into something that resembles a dinosaurian ancestor, um, check this out right here. Oh, wait, maybe first before we watch this, let me entice you first with uh, the journalist on this piece. Leslie Stahl uh, thought this was the coolest thing ever. Take a look. This Sunday's 60 Minutes has a profile of renowned paleontologist Jack Horner. He reveals a surprising and controversial discovery by his team that some say could lead to a real-life Jurassic Park. Hmm. Is that a blood vessel? Also a blood vessel. You're you see the branches? Kind right of. Here. We'll talk about that. So consistent over and over. Doki Doki Baka. Thank you. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you for being here. 60 Minutes correspondent <laughs> Leslie Stahl is here with more. Good morning, Leslie. So she says this is her favorite story that she has ever done. This is about 10 years ago, but still. Good. What did they find in that dinosaur bone? Well, first you have to know that they're breaking the bones to get stuff out to look. Anyway, yeah, she's going to do some spoilers here, but let's go to the end. Uh, their experiments right. over and Blue over. Cheap. They're bringing more and more people around to think that they yeah. uh, 
it's right to pursue this. Mm. It's right to, to keep going. It sounds like a perfect 60 Minutes talk. I know. You know what? Uh, does the audio need to be higher, Lenita? Yeah. About the blood vessels. That's mm. not. That's only part of the story. How they found this, what they call B Rex, Bob Rex. <laughs> How they found it is mm. astonishing. Yeah. And then the breaking apart to see what's inside. All of it is just. Uh, uh, Am I hyping too much? No, we can't wait to see it. I'm sure <laughs> it will up to the hype. You say, just so I we love how know. enthusiastic she is about I'm this. Uh, not. It's good when a reporter is that excited about I'm her story. Right. I'm Leslie, great to see you. Great, thank you. Leslie well, used to sit on this couch, but there was no couch back then. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Here is the piece. Take a look. Yeah. There's something about dinosaurs that captures the imagination. Giant, mysterious animals that roamed the earth for millions of years now gone forever. All they've left us are their fossils, the dried out mineral remnants of the creatures mm. they once were, with the organic material that gave them life long gone, or so everyone always thought. That is until B. rex, a 68 <laughs> million year old Tyrannosaurus rex who... Oh, hang on a minute. I'm, I think this part, well, you know, yeah, this part might... If I end up uh, uploading this to YouTube, which I usually do, then this part might get copyright flagged. So let's try and hang on a minute here. Give me, give me just a second. Let's unflip this so you can actually see it. Um, that'll be under transform. Flip horizontal. There we go. Yeah. Good stuff. <clears throat> Yeah. So I really like to show this, especially for a bunch of new people, because this helps explain kind of the milieu that I was brought up in. This is the museum that I went to. Jack Horner was my old boss. You know, he was the, the graduate advisor for Liz Friedman Fowler and for Denver Fowler. Um, Denver Fowler especially was like my mentor back when I was at Mon back in Montana. I worked under Denver for a long time. So kind of an unorthodox approach to dinosaur paleontology. This is kind of my pedigree here. And uh, and this is really, really cool stuff. I think you're going to be blown away by it. Take a look. It'll continue right now, actually. There we go. Yeah. Yep. Watershed moment. So yeah, the film Jurassic Park was hugely influential to dinosaur paleontology. You know, Jim Kirkland, who I was working with last summer, he's the state paleontologist for the state of Utah. Um, he's, yeah, named a whole bunch of new dinosaurs. Utah Raptor, if you're familiar with that dinosaur. That's one of his. That's one of Jim's babies, Utah Raptor. Jim says, yeah, before Jurassic Park, we had something like maybe 40 or 50 full-time dinosaur paleontologist in the whole world after jurassic park it like doubled or tripled there is a tremendous surge in public interest for dinosaurs and a huge surge in funding for dinosaur science jim personally was able to uh to raise you know uh you know raise a bunch of money off of all the hype around jurassic park and like it was a, it was a really really big deal and it that's one of the reasons why we have so many dinosaur paleontologists nowadays is uh, is because of this film right here yep uh Say the magic word. There you go, Jextra. <laughs> and I love this. Here are several living legends in dinosaur paleontology right now. There is Holly Woodward, who after marriage, I guess, is now Holly Woodward Ballard. She's a doctor in paleontology now. She works on Myasaura, dinosaur histology. 
There is Dr. Denver Fowler. Back before he was Dr. Denver Fowler, my kind of my mentor back in college, Liz Friedman Fowler. She married Denver. And here's Bob Harmon right here. You're going to hear more about Bob later in this. Tree Niner Foxy, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. There go Lenina and Claire, yeah. <laughs> uh. Yep. Yep. This, these are the teeth of B Rex, and I actually happen to have one of these right here. Uh, this, ladies and germs, is uh, is one of the teeth of B. Rex. This is a cast, obviously. For the real one, you know, where does a real dinosaur fossil belong? That belongs in a museum. I'm not streaming to you from a museum right now. I'm streaming to you from my office in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but yeah, this is an exact copy, of a molded and cast replica of one of B. Rex's teeth Correct in every detail. Pretty cool stuff. It is, you can even see the serrations right here. That kind of cutting surface along here, right there. Yeah. And the thing about Tyrannosaurus teeth, especially when the animals are full grown, is these teeth are very, very thick in cross section. This is not like a, a narrow steak knife style tooth. Sharply serrated for like slicing, cutting. This is a big, hefty, chonky tooth. Really thick in cross section. Like a railroad spike or a banana. Just made for, made for, evolved for puncturing and then maybe even crushing bone, we think. These animals had incredibly powerful jaws and their teeth are built to match. Very thick, sturdy teeth on here. So yeah, yeah. Baby's arm, McPickle, oh no, what? Um, and there you go, Charlie's Dragon, yeah, yeah. And Jack's gonna tell you about the uh, the groove right here on the tooth, what that is for. This, by the way, most of this is root. So like, only this much of the tooth would actually stick up out of the jaw. The rest of this is the root that's embedded in the jaw. And, uh, and Jack is gonna tell you about that. Right here, Not just yeah. Any teeth, the teeth of the oldest T Rex ever found. Yeah. Pocket right here in the teeth. Yeah. This is where the next tooth sits. Yep. Dinosaurs replaced their teeth throughout their life, and oh. T Rex replaced it all of their teeth every year. And here you can see. There you go, fall machine. <laughs> but Horner is most famous for discovering a kinder, gentler side of dinosaurs. You like that? It and isn't that cool? Uh, no, uh, King of Nerds. Yeah, yeah. Dinosaurs re re replace their teeth all the time. Mammals are different. We as mammals are weirdos. Mammals usually only get two sets of teeth for their whole lives, and then they're done. Like we get our baby teeth and then our adult teeth, and then we're done. Dinosaurs weren't like that. They're like sharks, or like just about any other kind of vertebrate animal, just constantly replacing teeth all the time uh, a tooth breaks or a tooth get you know there's another tooth coming up underneath it pushing out that tooth like a constant conveyor belt of teeth most animals with teeth are like that mammals are the weird ones out and jellyfin thank you for the follow welcome to paleontologizing yeah here we go
It's at least placental is now. I don't know if it's other mammals too. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Pay, pay close attention to this, not to uh, pay attention to what Jack says, but pay maybe greater attention to the reaction of the journalist here interviewing him. See how excited she gets by this. Um, and this is, again, in the collections at Museum of the Rockies. I've spent a lot of time in here over the years. So when we go out and dig up dinosaur fossils... They get prepped in the laboratory, and I prepped a lot of dinosaur fossils for Museum of the Rockies. A few, at least, when I had time between classes and work and other stuff. Um, but they end up here in the collections. This is like a curated space. The fossils are kept. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Blong. Thank you for the follow. Uh, this is where we safely house these fossils so that we can study them, and visiting researchers can study them. A museum is a really special almost sacred kind of place, you know? These are not bones gathering dust on a shelf. These are fossils being held in perpetuity in the public trust for scientists to study for centuries into the future. You know, this is the whole reason why we have museums, is to preserve these important scientific specimens long into the future. Museum of the Rockies has one of the world's largest collections of dinosaur fossils. And that's almost entirely due to Jack Horner. Um, when Jack started at MOR, they had like a couple of dinosaur fossils. Now they've got one of the world's largest collections. And uh, it's because really Jack really... What paleontology is like. <laughs> <laughs> Lysander Salamander, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Lysander or Lysander? It's probably Lysander, isn't it? Thank you for following. Anyway, um, yeah, collections, a magical, almost sacred place. You know, you've got here the blood, sweat, and tears of so many paleontologists and volunteers, field workers, you know, just like giving their all to get these fossils out of the rock in one piece, bring them back to the laboratory, clean them, prepare them, you know, make like these wonderful cradles for them so that future scientists can come and study them really the to to work in a museum like this it's it's kind of a selfless act you're not doing that for your own fortune and glory it's not for personal gain it's i am working on these fossils i you know i dug them up i'm cleaning them i'm putting all of this love into them so that Someone in the future can come along and study them to learn about the ancient past. It's actually fairly rare that a paleontologist studies the same fossils that she digs up. I've never studied any of the fossils that I've dug up. That's all gone to other researchers, you know? It's all a collective enterprise, you know? You are out there giving it your all, sacrificing so that someone else can study those fossils usually. And you rely on other people to do the same thing for you. Now, I've worked on fossils that other people have dug up and given their own blood, sweat, and tears for. And, you know, we're contributing to a project that's larger than any one of us. That's what it's all about. So, yeah, the cycle of science. There you go, Golganek. Yeah, yeah. Lawnmower robots, no, freelancer. Those don't, they don't work. We could talk about that another time maybe if you want. But, uh, and David Delune, the data analysis, absolutely, David, yes, yes. We'll talk about that another time, too, but collecting data at the site of a, a fossil is useless without associated data. It might as well be a doorstop, you know? Um, the data is what makes a fossil scientifically useful and valuable. Anyway, back to, uh, to what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Miracle Schmiegel says, is there a reason paleontologists tend not to study what they excavate? Usually because, well, a lot of paleontologists might work on a particular group of animals or a particular aspect of, 
I don't know. I've dug up several turtle fossils over the years. Iguanodontian fossils. Triceratops fossils. So many triceratops. I don't work on triceratops. You never know what you're going to find. Unless you work on, like, a really common group of animals. And then you know you're going to find them. It's like... Yeah. But sometimes you can kind of tailor your expertise to what you find. Or if you find a really rare kind of dinosaur, you can go, shoot, I'm going to learn everything there is to know about this kind of dinosaur, and then I'm going to publish on this specimen that I found. But yeah, so I guess if you're an early career researcher, you can be a little bit more flexible. If you haven't really, like, picked a lane, and you're not, like, a world authority on a particular group of animals, then shoot, you can shift gears, and you can start working on the things that you found. But it's, it's a big, wide world out there. There's so many different kinds of critters. And especially people later on in their careers, they've specialized to a point. They've become the world authority on, you know, Chasmosaurian ceratopsians or trionicid turtles or, I don't know, hybodont sharks or something like that. And if you're out in the field and you find something that you don't work on, it's like, well, shoot. I guess I could be an author on this paper, but I would need to bring in some experts who actually know this group better than I do. Does that make sense? I hope this is making sense. Yeah. Uh, Want to see Danny dig up a Baryonyx? I'd have to get my butt to Europe, Zintaus, for that. Or possibly North Africa. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to, uh, to this right here. Yeah. Oh. Anyway. Um... Yeah, so here's Jack and journalist Leslie Stahl from 60 Minutes here in the collections. Pay attention to her reaction when he's talking about these thigh bones. Yeah. <laughs> I love that reaction. That makes me so happy as a paleontologist to see somebody get that excited about dinosaur growth, you know? What is our word for this on this channel, everybody? Long-time paleontologizing viewers? Dinosaurs are put together correctly. Swims with whales. Ontogeny. Thanks for the follow. You're smart. Welcome. Ontogeny. Do a research Ontogeny. Oliver. I never... <laughs> Ontogeny. Ontogeny is our word for uh, for growth during an animal's lifetime. So dinosaur ontogeny, like studying what happens to these animals between when they are a hatchling and, for instance, a one-year-old here. And here, yeah, a little less than a month old. Yeah, but and here, here is the same bone <gasps> of an adult of a one-year-old. A one-year-old. <laughs> Warner figured out that such rapidly yeah. dinosaurs couldn't walk at first, meaning that their parents were bringing food back yeah. to them in the nest. Thank you, Swims with Whales. I appreciate you. His discoveries lent support to a then-controversial but now widely accepted theory. Here we go. Dinosaurs actually gave rise to modern birds. Yeah. If a little kid today studies all this in school, Mm -hmm. and they look up in the sky and see a bird and turn to mom and say, you know, that's a dinosaur. They're right. They're right. They're right. Jack Horner <laughs> told us that birds are dinosaurs. And she's, so she's talking to this uh, evolutionary biologist here. Yeah. They're right. They're right. Jack Horner told us that birds are dinosaurs. Do you agree with that? What is he going to say? Sean Carroll, professor of evolutionary biology, what is he going to say? Are are birds dinosaurs? Is this is there any kind of general scientific consensus about this? That's a crazy idea, right? You know, are birds dinosaurs? The very notion, unimaginable, right? Tyrannosaurus. Has kinship with a chickadee? How could that be the case? 
Hmm. Hmm. Yep. <laughs> so this is the general scientific consensus nowadays. We've got so overwhelming amounts of evidence. It is undeniable nowadays. Birds evolved from a dinosaur, which is pretty extraordinary. You know, birds are dinosaurs. They evolved from a dinosaur ancestor. Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. There we go, Miss Coggins. <laughs> this was like ten years ago. So yeah, it's it's even more settled today than it was back then. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Mary. Thank you, Smurf, for the hydrate. Cheers. <laughs> so, it's not how paleontologists tell the difference between rock and bone. We can tell the difference by looking at it or by feeling it. We're not sticking every dinos potential dinosaur bone to our tongue to see if it sticks. But that's a, a neat little, like, parlor trick that you can pull out to, uh, uh, to impress donors or journalists or other people. You know, it works, but that's not how professionals do it, you know? So, yeah, she, uh, she was on a science fair merry-go-round with Jack and Mary. There you go, Jody Fish. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, is, this is some good stuff. It's some good stuff. And there you go, converted optimist. Some good aged bone broth. Yeah, 80 million years old aged. Holy cow. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hey, Nader Fiend, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yep. Most rocks. Colic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the 19 months of support, Colic. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Oh, so looking at the insides of dinosaur bones. Here we go. Uh, Hmm. Yep. <laughs> and he's bright. He's bright. Yeah. Yeah. Um, astronomy show says, do serpentine minerals slash rocks also behave similar to the lictite? Not in my... We've got a lot of serpentinite here in the... 
shoot, if you go just below the the southern end of the Golden Gate Bridge here in the uh, here in the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area, you know, you go uh, you go right down there under the southern end of the Golden Gate Bridge. There's a lot of serpentinite there, and the cliffs above Marshall's Beach and Baker Beach, serpentinite and. Uh, I've never tried to press it to my tongue, but um, I'd be very surprised if it if it stuck. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, hoping Danny isn't an A's fan. A's. I. You know, I like I like all of our letters in the English alphabet, Ms. Coggins. I don't uh, I don't discriminate about that. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Let's get back to our video here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And holy cow, I say this every time we watch this video, but Bob Harmon, I used to say he was a living legend. Um, yeah, Bob Harmon, holy cow. If I were to describe, you know, I've, I've said this many times before. Um... Bob Harmon, I've worked with him for several years. Force of nature in the field. Every time we ran into any kind of a problem, Bob could solve it. Anytime something looked impossible, Bob would figure it out. He would make it work. Just an absolute force of nature, almost supernatural. So I, I had the privilege of working with Bob Harmon in the field for a number of years in the Hell Creek Formation of Eastern Montana, the same formation they're talking about here with T-Rex. And then uh, I left Montana after that. I've been here in California ever since. Um, but I was watching a, a film a couple of years ago, not too long after it came out, and I... Uh, I was like, holy cow, one of the characters in this film really reminds me of Bob Harmon. Like, it's, it's like I, I know this person. It's like I've met him before, and I realize he reminded me of Bob Harmon. And that was Brad Pitt's character from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Same demeanor, same general vibe, basically the same guy. So if you're trying to picture Bob Harmon... You know, picture Brad Pitt's character in, uh, you know, in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Basically the same guy. And I don't know how to describe that. I'm not a novelist, you know. I I don't know the proper adjectives or similes. I can just say, I can use a metaphor. Bob Harmon, Brad Pitt's character from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So yeah, you catch what I mean? Like, have people seen this movie? I hope you have. Here we go. Blah, 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 blah. Wrong video. Sorry. Let's get rid of that one. Bob Harmon here. Yeah. A force of nature. Bob Harmon. And he, he didn't just wander away from the dig site. They're kind of making this story a little friendly. He got into a big fight with Jack Horner. And he, he like he just w walked a long way to cool off. I don't know how, how far he walked. It might have been a couple of miles. But when that happened... Yeah... Yeah. 
Yeah. The look at this image right here. It really doesn't quite do it justice. But um this is on the side of a cliff, you know? Yeah. Uh, true goat DNH, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um. So, unfortunately, well, Bob Harmon, living legend. Um. Until very recently. Yeah. There we go. Um. Yep. Uh, Bob Herman passed away at the end of January or beginning of February of this year. Um, yeah, Bob Harmon. I, uh, for like months after this, I couldn't talk about him without getting choked up. Um, we had the, an incredible amount of steam for, uh, esteem for Bob Harmon. Just... Yeah, um, a legend in the field, going back a long time. Jack Horner actually discovered Bob Harmon in the field. Here he is working at the Wonkle Rex site. Can we get some Wonkle Rex yes emotes going in the chat? Um, but yeah, yeah. So Jack was out looking for for T Rex one day, and uh, he didn't end up finding any T Rex that day, as as the story goes. But he ran into Bob Harmon in the field, who was also out looking for a T Rex. And he's like, This guy is pretty serious. He carries a pretty serious looking gun. And he seems to know his stuff. And he like offered him a job on the spot. Um and Bob had worked for Jack ever since. And uh Yeah, yeah. So those yes emotes that are there in the chat right now. Those are the Wonkle Rex, and here is Bob Harmon on that site with Kathy Wonkle, the discoverer of the Wonkle Rex. Uh, this is back in 1989 or 1990. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, Bob Harmon. And there is that famous photo of him <laughs> on the cliff with the rocks and the folding chair. Holy cow, Bob Harmon. Um, his legend will live on for as long as there is a science of paleontology. For as long as human beings study dinosaurs, Bob Harmon will be remembered for his contributions, for his grit. A, a truly legendary figure. So, yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. My cast jacket, but yeah. Yeah. Uh. There you go, Lenina. <laughs> Lenina says, luckily, OSHA doesn't frequent paleontological digs. I mean, we're sleeping in tents every night. We're, you know, pooping into holes in the ground that we dig. We are working in a 110, 120 degree temperatures, swinging picks in the sun, shoveling just tons and tons and tons of matrix. Uh, OSHA. Shoot. Yeah. I wish we had the kind of wherewithal to to have OSHA safe working conditions in places like this, but we don't, you know? We're working with very limited budgets. Um, Oh, boy. Yeah. I remember once... Uh, 
I've been shot at in the field by a presumably nearsighted hunter. I've uh, woken up with a rattlesnake on my chest first thing in the morning. <laughs> OSHA. OSHA. Oh, boy. Now, for anybody wondering what OSHA is, by the way, if you're not from the United States, it's the Occupational Safety Hazard Association or something like that. It's basically like a government authority that ensures that workplaces are safe for workers. Um. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. The Rattler just wanted to get warm. It literally did, Zinthaus. Yeah, she was she was real, real sluggish. It was a very cold night. Um, but yeah, that's what disclaimer waivers are for. I'm pretty sure. I I feel like I've signed very few disclaimer waivers in the field. It's all like, you know, it's just kind of assumed that like you're not gonna sue us, right? If you die. Like, no, of course, because I'll be dead, you know? Everybody's happy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> yeah. And by the way, I feel like I should I should make a disclaimer here real quick. When I'm saying, oh, Osho, what's that? And I had a, somebody shoot at me and a rattlesnake on my chest and, like, driving on dangerous roads and blah, 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 lightning strikes, etc. This is not me being like, oh, look at me, big macho Danny, you know? Like, real men in the field or something like that. That's not what this is about. It's like, we have to work under those conditions because we have no other choice. Fossils are in very remote areas, oftentimes. The badlands of eastern Utah, the badlands of eastern Montana, just about anywhere in Wyoming. You know, we might be miles and miles, we might be a hundred miles from the nearest town. We usually don't have electricity, running water. We never have flush toilets. We're lucky to even have, like, a bucket that we can, uh, you know, drop a deuce into. It's, um, yeah, uh, paleontology, especially dinosaur paleontology. For the amount of money that dinosaurs bring into the world economy... We, our budgets are minuscule, microscopic, nanoparticular. <laughs> um, I've been on, on field crews before where our entire budget for a whole field season is like $900. Um, yeah, it's not that we're doing this to be macho. It's that we don't have the cash. We don't have the cash to make it any more hospitable or you know what I mean yeah so I want to make that clear I want to make that clear anyway let's uh let's continue here yeah ah I mean, holy cow, they had a, a helicopter. This is back when they had big, big budgets. This is before my time at Museum of the Rockies. Those days are gone. They don't have helicopter money anymore. This is back when Jack was getting grants from National Geographic Society and money from Discovery Channel and stuff like that. Um, nowadays, Museum of the Rockies crews... Yeah. Uh, they're lucky if they get to do field work at all, honestly. For a number of years, they just didn't do field work, as I understand it, after I left. But yeah. Yeah. Terry Beck, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And I... 
I got to point this out because this is really amusing to me as a scientist. The the difference between the uh, the wording of the journalist and the scientist here. So uh let's see if you can pick up the difference. Um I'll play it one more time here. Ever, anyone had ever been able to... Here it is. Here's that moment. Did anybody in... There you go. Claire Burr got it right there. Yes. Indeed. Identify gender slash sex. Exactly, Jody Fish. Those are two very different things. So the journalist says gender. Uh, this is Leslie Stahl right here. She says gender of this dinosaur. And the scientist says sex of this dinosaur. So biological sex and gender are two very different things. Ask any scientist about this. Holy cow. Um, yeah, so gender is like a human thing. And it comes with all kinds of like societal baggage and, you know, it. we talk about gender when we're talking about human beings. We don't really talk about that with other organisms because it's not like a scientific term, you know? Gender is like a societal construct. Biological sex is something very different. And gender can be really squishy. Very squishy. Biological sex can also be very squishy as well. But in this case, the only reason that we can tell uh, a male dinosaur from a female dinosaur... Well, that's not even framing this properly. The only time that we can tell the sex of a dinosaur so far? In the year 2023... The only way that we can tell if a dinosaur is female or male, and we can't tell if they're male. We can only tell if they're female. And we can only tell if they're female if they happen to have been pregnant when they died. If they were currently ovulating, if they were currently producing eggs, or in the process of producing eggs, then we can tell that, like, yeah, this is an egg-laying individual. This is a female, I guess. We still have no evidence of any male dinosaurs. Because it, that's what we've got with the fossil record, you know? We're super lucky to even have this, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Identify, and here Mary Schweitzer says identify sex in a dinosaur, and Leslie Stahl, the journalist, says gender in a dinosaur. <laughs> Yeah, medullary bone. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. This is super, super wild. It just keeps getting more and more wild. I love the way that they build in this 60 Minutes piece. It's it's extraordinary. Yep. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty extraordinary. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And the Again, Mary, consummate scientist here. This is how it works in science. You get a fluke result and you go, well, shoot, something could have gone wrong. I don't believe it. Do it again. Repeat it. Repeatability is one of the cornerstones of science. Like, if, if you get a weird result, it's not like, oh, hold the presses. Let's announce this to the world. Let's... No. If you get a really weird result, you got to make sure it's real. You got to repeat the experiment. You got to do it again and again. And again, and then you have other researchers and other laboratories 
try and repeat the same process. And if everybody can do it, then you know you've got a real phenomenon right there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yeah. Wild. That kind of overset rules of science. They're more like kind of like assumptions like yeah we wouldn't expect to see this kind of thing but holy cow there it is it's not a rule it's like a eh, we don't think that we'd find this you know more like guidelines there you go doki doki bucket yes yeah <laughs> Yep. And so this again, this is how science works. You so th there's an old an old phrase, I don't know who coined it, but there's a phrase that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If you're claiming something that's really really wild, you better have the evidence to back that up, you know? And so this is how science works, you know? This is good science right here. You publish something really extraordinary and other scientists are naturally going to be very skeptical of that. That's how science works. This is science working as intended, you know? These scientists aren't being spoil sports. They're not being villains or grinches or whatever. This is how science is supposed to work, you know? You say something really crazy and off the wall and people are going to say, prove it, you know? Uh, what if this happened or what if that happened? What if you made a mistake? You know, there's that phrase that science checks itself before it wrecks itself. This is the system working as intended. So yeah, yeah. Not attacked. There you go, Jody Fish. Yeah, yeah. Carl Sagan Murph, yep. Picks where it didn't happen, says Charlie's Dragon. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Science, you require, we, we require proof. That's how it works, you know? That's what sets science apart from other modes of inquiry, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, anywho. Hey, Pelo Cola here. Bienvenidos. Yeah. And actually, the fact that they say 80 million year old duckbill right here and they don't actually mention a genus or species, that implies to me this might be super duck that we're talking about here. Yeah. They don't say a genus, they don't see a species. And thank you, Luna Beans, for the follow. Welcome, welcome. I'm pretty sure this might be a reference to uh, before Super Duck actually got a proper name. Um, yeah. Liz Friedman Fowler, Super Duck. There we go. Yeah. This is super cool. I think this this is probably it. So here is Liz Friedman Fowler, whom you saw earlier in the uh, in the piece there. She's now married to Denver Fowler, who is my mentor for a good while when I lived in Montana. But yeah, yeah, she holds a f uh, holds a drawing depicting a new species of duckbill dinosaur that she has helped uncover and and detail. 
whatever. Anyway, yeah. But uh, Pro Brachylophosaurus is the new genus. Pro Brachylophosaurus burgi. There you go. And this is super exciting because it's called Pro Brachylophosaurus because it's found in rocks just older and below those of Brachylophosaurus. So Liz and other scientists think that this animal is ancestral to this animal. It is, this evolved into this. Pro Brachylophosaurus evolved into Brachylophosaurus. And you see the crest right here is very large on Brachylophosaurus and it's much smaller on Pro Brachylophosaurus 1.5 million years earlier. So this is a wonderful example of what we call anagenesis, which we'll talk about a little bit when we're talking about Tyrannosaurus. So really, really neat. Here is a link to this article here. The Montana State University press office botched it a little bit, but um, anyway, I'm pretty sure this is the same critter that uh, I'm pretty sure this is the same critter that uh, that Mary Schweitzer was working on. That's why they just called it a duckbill. They don't give it a scientific name because it hadn't been named yet. Pro Brachylophosaurus, I think, was named in 2017 or 2018. It's a long time after this came out. Yeah. A very funny scout. <laughs> uh, yep. Holy cow. I think, you know, this is like 10 years later today. I think most of her critics have kind of come around to the idea that like, yeah, shoot, this is legit. Because she's continued to do this again and again and again. Repeatability, one of the cornerstones of science. And Mary's been able to repeat these things again and again. And people in other laboratories have been able to do the same thing. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Luna Bean says, my small kiddo has been getting into dinosaurs lately, and I've been watching all of the Jurassic Park movies. Holy cow, Luna Beans. Well, welcome to Paleontologizing. It is great to have you here. My name is Danny. I work on dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. I dig up dinosaurs. You know, if you've been watching the, uh, the Jurassic Park movies recently, you know the Sam Neill's character in that? Dr. Alan Grant. That's based on my old boss, Jack Horner. And we're watching a video about him and his colleagues at the museum I used to work at back in Montana. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, you'll see him in a minute. Ah. Yep. By the way, there's Liz right there. Liz always wears a blue bandana in the field. Well, I don't know if it's always blue, but here's Liz here. Yep, there's her bandana. That's Liz's field attire, you know? Yeah. So here's Jack. Yep, here we go. Yeah. Yep. Great book, by the way. I mean, uh, the the prose isn't exactly the most. Uh, I don't know, inspirational or in or, I don't know, but the content, holy cow, is it? Extraordinary. Good stuff. Check out this book, How to Build a Dinosaur. You can even get it on, like, there's a, a pretty decent audiobook through Audible, I think. It's well worth the read. So, uh, yeah.
Yep. Luna Bean says, aren't mosquitoes and alligators crocodiles considered to have ancient DNA as well? I mean, every creature that exists today, every creature has some DNA, like DNA from its ancestors. Yeah. Yeah. But birds are the only dinosaurs that survived the asteroid impact. Crocodiles and alligators are not dinosaurs. So they don't have dinosaur DNA in them. Birds do, because birds literally are dinosaurs. The reason that, that Jack Horner picked a chicken for this project is that chickens are very widely available. There is, like, what is it, 10 times as many chickens on our planet as there are human beings. So there's something like 80 billion chickens in the world or something crazy like that. Somebody can look it up. There's an, an insane number of chickens in the world. So they're they're not difficult to come by. Um, and the the genome of the chicken is pretty well studied. So a lot of the legwork has already been done for this. So yeah, yeah. And pro Brachylophosaurus translated would be before short crested reptile. Exactly, Paleocolahia, yes. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. So if you want to make a dinosaur, the easiest way to do it is, like Jack says, to use a chicken. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. True. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> anyway, there is that right there. Here is a link if you'd like to watch this to get the story on your own. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. That's for all the new people. That's kind of a little taste as to like the the scientific milieu that I came of age in. You know, this is kind of the environment in which I grew to be a paleontologist. I guess if that makes sense. Cool stuff, right? Still makes me excited. So, I think Jack is still working on this project. You know? Um, yeah, and if you'd like to uh, to see more about the Dino Chicken Project, I will pull up for you his TED Talk. Um, yeah. Building a dinosaur from a chicken. Here is Jack talking about that. Yeah. And then, uh... Dana Rashid, who is, I think, now lead researcher on this. For the slightly more up-to-date video here. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. Yeah. Maybe these movies could at some point fund this science. I wish, Caliban. I wish. 
That's the thing, is that, like, dinosaur movies are huge! They're big business! They make a lot of money! Do we see that as paleontologists? No! We don't! We, uh... We absolutely do not usually see any money from this kind of thing. That's just, unfortunately, not how things are structured. You know? We're out there giving our blood, sweat, and tears, digging up these fossils in 110 degree heat out in the badlands of the Rocky Mountain West. And many of us are, I don't know, living well below the poverty line. And the dinosaurs that appear in these movies would not, nobody would know about them if it weren't for our hard work, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, they're dinosaurs. Of course they're huge. Well, not all dinosaurs are huge. Asteroid Panda. In fact, a huge number of, uh... I don't know. You, you'll hear a, uh... Kind of like, oh, fun fact every once in a while. Like, the average dinosaur is about the size of a sheep. That's probably about true. Yeah. Most dinosaurs weren't huge, huge, huge. Although, I suppose the average dinosaur would definitely be larger than the average size mammal today. The average Mesozoic dinosaur, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. And S.V. Harkin, I completely agree with you, S.V. Harkin. Yeah, scientists are exploited because of her passion, oftentimes, yes. Yeah. And there he goes in Taos, yeah, that's very true. Anyway, speaking of little mammals, somebody had a question about little mammals. Uh, where was that? Let me scroll up. The King of the Nerds says, so it basically, it's like how after one of the previous extinction events, all mammals came from one species that survived. A few species, King of the Nerds. Yeah, yeah. Here, we actually have a news item about that. So that's a lovely segue to get into our news here. Let me pull that up. Um, yeah. Where is that? And thank you, Pat66, for the follow. I appreciate you. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Um, I think that will be right... Where was that? Um, come on now. Uh, I've got a little graphic that kind of shows. Dinosaur! Gigantic dinosaurs attacking our boy! A dinosaur? Sev Tiny Wizard, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Where did that little graphic go? I had to just, like, I had to bookmark this so I don't have trouble finding it in the future. There we go. That's it right there. Yeah. Image in new tab. Nope. Come on, Google Photos. Being ridiculous. There we go. Um. Rates K-PG. There we go. So, at the end of the Cretaceous period, these are kind of rough extinction rates for these different groups of animals that were around at the time. So our non-avian dinosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus here, 100% extinct. None of the non-avian dinosaurs survived the asteroid impact. Birds, 94% of them went extinct. Only about 6% 6, 6 of birds survived. About 92% of squamates, that's lizards and their snake descendants. Uh, only about 92% of them, well, 92% of them survived, uh, went extinct, excuse me. Only about 8% survived. Amphibians do pretty well. Only about 22% of them died. Same with turtles. Crocodilians do even better, 20%. Freshwater fishes, about 40% of them die. About 90% of mammal species died out. Um, so yeah, about 90% of the mammals at the end of the age of dinosaurs pff, died out from the asteroid impact. So yeah, yeah. Um, 
which is kind of crazy, right? Super, super devastating event. Somebody type in exclamation mark extinction for a little, uh, little command write-up about that that I did a while ago. Yeah. Uh, and roses and tea. Oh, that would be wonderful, roses and tea. Then we'll post roses and tea. I will very happily open those on air. I can't wait. We were talking about chocolate bilbies. Speaking of mammals. Thank you, roses and tea. Yeah. Um, but yeah, survived on whole food. There you go, Andy then did, yeah. By living in holes, probably. But yeah, yeah. Um, and Pat66 says, question, what era is your favorite? That says, easy question there. Pat, a good, good question, but an easy question. Here's our international chrono stratigraphic chart. Let's switch to linear time here. There we go. Yeah. So, eras are up here. Eras. Eras are huge, huge spans of time. So here's the Cenozoic. This is what we're at the at in today, you know, in the present. Cenozoic era. This is what we call oftentimes the age of mammals. Although you could also call it the age of birds. There's like twice as many species of birds than there are of mammals. So, pfft. Afuera. Get out of here, mammals. It's the age of birds. So you could say it's really a continuation of the Mesozoic. The age of dinosaurs and other reptiles. The Mesozoic has got to be my favorite for certain because the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods are within the Mesozoic era. So an era is, uh, it's like a huge span of time, and different geologic periods fit into those. So Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic all fit into the Mesozoic era. And then you've got subdivisions upper and lower Cretaceous. And then you've got the different stages or epochs there. And George from New York, thank you, thank you for those five gift subs. That is excellent. George from New York. Thank you. Thank you, George. I appreciate that very kindly. Very much. I appreciate your kindly support very much. Thank you, George. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. But, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh. Millie Bedelia. BC Museum. Is that British Columbia, Amelia Bedelia? Sounds like a sheep with a long lizard tail and a big skull with a short, sharp beak. It almost sounds like Cetacosaurus, Amelia Bedelia. Or Protoceratops, maybe? I don't know. I've got a Protoceratops skull. Look! Right here in my office. Right there, the big white one. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. We were talking about extinction rates. We're talking about these different eras. Mammals, they almost bit the dust at the same time as the dinosaurs did, except for birds. Birds almost bit the dust, too. Shoot. However, we've got this article right here to talk about. Came out a little while ago on the 12th. Starting small and simple was the key to success for the evolution of mammals. Reveals new study. The thing that you got to understand about mammals, and mammals are, of course, our ancestors. We, as human beings, are mammals. Let's do a Google image search, maybe, for mammals. Mammals. Mammals are... Here's land mammals of Louisiana. Um, mammals are creatures that often have fur or hair. They usually give birth to live young. Although a few of them lay eggs, like platypus and echidnas. Some of them carry their young in a pouch. Like the opossum that you see up here. That's our only marsupial in the upper corner there. That opossum there. But most mammals today are placental. They give birth to live young. And all mammals feed their young with milk. So mammals. You know them. You love them. You are them. You're a mammal, chat. Chances are. Unless we got any birds or... Lizards watching. 
There. We might have some birds watching, but they're not the ones who clicked on this. If you clicked on this and you're typing in chat, let's face it, you're a mammal. You know, human beings are mammals. Um, yeah. Mammals. Bats and dolphins and leopards and dogs are mammals. You know mammals. Everybody knows mammals. So. During the age of dinosaurs, mammals were really small. The funny thing is, mammals and dinosaurs show up around the same time. Dinosaurs get really big. And they can occupy all kinds of different body size niches throughout the Mesozoic era. And mammals never, ever, ever during the Mesozoic get any bigger than like this. Basically, every mammal during the age of dinosaurs is smaller than like a big loaf of bread. In fact, most of them are like smaller than a grapefruit. Many of them are smaller than a tangerine. Some of them are as big as a grape. You know? I do call myself an expert in dinosaur studies. Six foot turkey, thank you for the six months of support. Six foot turkey, I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, um. So yeah, yeah, mammals. <laughs> so the ancestor of modern mammals survived this asteroid impact. Uh oh. Shoot. Oh. False alarm. Given the presence of a sauropod and a Parasaurolophus there. Change things with those five gift subs. That's like a Campanian ecosystem. Asteroid didn't hit then, as we saw. Matt M33, five gift subs from you. One, two, three, four, five. Thank you, Matt M33, for your support. Look, we're at 42 out of 60 now. Holy moly. That's 21 thirtieths, which would be 7 tenths. We're 70% of the way to our sub goal for the day. Thanks to you, Matt M33. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Let's get back to mammals and how we managed to survive. Yeah. So the ancestors of modern mammals managed to evolve into one of the most successful of animal lineages. The key was to start out small and simple, a new study reveals. And it really gets serious, as we're seeing here. Victarius. Holy cow. Thank you, Victarius. Victarius is getting serious with those five gift subs. Thank you, Victarius, for those five gift subs. Gratefully accepted. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Victorious. 47 out of 60 now. 47 60th. That's down to its... Uh, it's reduced as far as it'll go. Thank you, Victorious. Holy cow! Moonrise Rabbit! Thank you very much, Moonrise Rabbit! In a museum. Thank you. I hit the Indiana Jones one by mistake. Fewer than 40 full time dinosaur paleontologists. And holy cow. Asteroid Panda. Another five gift subs. Are leading this expedition. Thank you. Thank you. Holy moly. Asteroid Panda and Moonrise Rabbit. Thank you for the five gift subs each. Really appreciate that. Really appreciate that. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Win the week. And thank you very much, Risu Dagu. Prerequisite to the evolution of large mammals into our own existence. Extraordinary. Good stuff. And thank you, Lordy, for the 300 bits. Is that what that was? Lanina, given three gift subs there, too. Here's a dinosaur meeting a mammal. Largest of land mammals. Yeet. It's like, it, it's like it's made of styrofoam. Lanina, thank you for the three gift subs. Thank you, Murph, for that one gift sub there. Really appreciate that. And Bet Medler. I've not checked my... Uh, here at my apartment, yes, just today, but not the P.O. Box, Bet Medler. I will have to check that out very soon. Did you send me something? 
Wow, I am excited. I will have to I'll have to go check. And Gita Aloha, thank you for the 300 bits. That is brilliant. Really appreciate that. Good stuff. Good stuff. Wow. Um and you did thank you, Bet Medler. I appreciate that. When we're 85% of the way to a level 5 hype train, we we might have some ukulele songs. Yeah. And thank you, Asteroid Panda. Hey. Asteroid Panda says, got paid today. Figured I'd support someone who does something they love. Thank you, Asteroid Panda. Thank you very much. Seriously. And Stink! Holy moly. Thank you for those five gift subs. I think you got us there. I think that's it. I think we're going to have some ukulele songs. Shoot. That's, uh... That's really excellent. Yeah. Holy moly. We're going to level six hype train? We'll see how far this goes. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really, really excellent. No, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to get the ukulele out and tuned. Let's see if we can get through the rest of this article real quick. But, uh... Yeah. It's where you, uh, see him, Nolo. That might come up in one of our songs. Yeah. So, yeah. So, this is talking about the, uh, of course, mammal skulls, mammal teeth. That's really most of what we have for Mesozoic mammals. Uh, so, Dr. Stefan Lautenschlager from University of Birmingham, Bir Birmingham commented, Reducing the number of bones led to a redistribution of stresses in the skull of early mammals. Stress re was redirected from the part of the skull housing the brain to the margins of the skull during feeding. Basically, by having like smaller and more efficient skulls. By miniaturizing their skulls. Yeah. Um, these animals were able to be pretty successful despite being super tiny. Combination of small size, reduced number of skull bones, and feeding on new food sources such as insects allowed the ancestors of modern mammals to thrive in the shadow of the dinosaurs. But it was not until dinosaurs became extinct, except for birds, at the end of the Cretaceous, 66 million years ago, the mammals had a chance to further diversify and reach the large body range. A large range of body sizes seen today. Here's a link to that article if you'd like to see it. But there you go. Mammals versus bugs, the eternal war. Yeah, I, I seen Starship Troopers, Clockwork Ninja. Mammals versus bugs. We'll extend far into the future. Yeah. And yeah, the American Lion Retro Roadshow, that's a that's a big critter. Much bigger than European or Asian lions. Asiatic lions, too. Yeah. Uh, would you like to know more? Oh, no, Claire Burr. I'm doing my part. I honestly, like, unironically, maybe a little ironically, hate that movie. I hate it. I hate watching it. Like, I appreciate that it's really good satire and it's well made and it's like... But it's painful for me to watch just because it's it's so fascist. It just, uh, 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 it's like makes me gag. Most Verhoeven movies are like that for me, to be honest. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, I realize that's the point. I realize that's what he's going for. It's a parody of, you know, it's like poking fun at fascism. But like even just seeing it, like, ah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I hate it. It's all the gore, too. Ugh. Uh, that is the point, Caliban. It is the point. I get that. I understand that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. But, yeah. It isn't funny. Sorry. I mean, it can be funny. It's just, it's such a mean-spirited movie. I, just, I hate the tone of it. It's just, like, I, I want to like it, but I just, like, viscerally, it bothers me so much. I just, I can't. You know? 
That's just how it goes. You know? So yeah, and the satire is not lost on me, Claire Burr. I, I really, that's not what you're saying. There are people who like, like that movie and they're like, oh yeah, rah, rah, society should be like that. And they're completely missing the point of it. Yeah. It's actually that way for a lot of movies. Yeah. Really spectacular spare, no expense. And thank you, Helix Fossil. Appreciate that very, very much. Holy cow. We've got like 15 seconds left for our hype train. Let me get out the old uke right now. And before we get into some more fossil news, let's play some ukulele songs real quick, shall we? All right, and let's get her tuned. Yeah, the old uke, the old ukulele. Uh, Clockwork Ninja. of the uke is expanding and stretching the strings but yeah yeah and thank you helix i appreciate that here i'm gonna play you some quick uh ukulele songs as a thank you for an incredible level five hype train there was it five i think it was five right um but first let's go ahead and switch our streaming category to music real quick here yeah there we go. And then we need a tag, I guess. Let's do acoustic. This is just going to be for a couple minutes. But we're going to do some ukulele songs about science. Let's warm up with the dinosaur march real quick. And uh, if you're not really into live music, just stick around. It's just going to be a couple minutes here. If you like live music, then again, apologies. This is just you know some songs on the ukulele. But some songs about science. <laughs> And uh, this one will get stuck in your head, in a good way, I hope. It's a song called "The Dinosaur March." This is it's a real earworm, but this is one that I learned from the old from the music teacher at the school that I used to teach at. But I had to modify some things to make it a bit more scientifically authentic. We'll see if you can pick out those parts. The Dinosaur March goes like this. Uh... No, it doesn't go like that. It goes. Many, many years ago, before the people came, the animals upon the earth, they did not look the same. They lived for 174 million years, but now they are no more. Except for birds, because as we all know, birds themselves are living dinosaurs, the last surviving members of dinosauria that somehow survived the asteroid impact 66 million years ago. And they've since diversified to the point that nowadays there's like 10,000 500 species of birds they outnumber mammal species something like two to one it's pretty incredible so in the grand scheme of things you could say that we're still really in the age of dinosaurs they were the dinosaurs apatosaurus diplodocus stegosaurus allosaurus Ankylosaurus and Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus Rex. So there's the first verse with a few modifications. But it didn't have a second verse when I learned it, so I had to write my own. Second verse goes like this. We can learn about these awesome beasts by studying their bones. Skeletons under the ground that partly turn to stone. We dig them up and we clean them and we raise them off the floor to build a dinosaur. A patosaurus diplodocus, Stegosaurus allosaurus, Ankylosaurus and Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus. Saurus Rex. There 
there you go. That's the dinosaur march. And we will be talking about Tyrannosaurus Rex in just a little bit when we do some more fossil news. In fact, that might even be our next item. Maybe we'll do high latitude dinosaur eggs first, and then we'll do uh, Tyrannosaurus individual count. That's how many T Rex actually lived during the reign of that species, Tyrannosaurus Rex. We'll talk about some estimates. Now, our next song, let's do I'm a Paleontologist after that. And uh, somebody had a joke about museums and why they're called museums. This song actually has that SM lyrics. This has become something of an informal anthem for this uh, this channel here. And, uh, yeah, it's by the band They Might Be Giants. It goes like this. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I seek, they're rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jaws, Rockyopteryx's wings, and all the kids want to see them. Here it comes. They're li lining up at a museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. Who I am. Could it be an herbivore? Crushing plants with rounded teeth or a ferocious carnivore to move so quickly on its feet. It's like pieces of a puzzle that I'd love to try and solve. So much fun to think about how a species has evolved and all the kids who want to see them are lining up at a museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, who I am. There you go. Make sure this thing is still in tune. Sound a little bit off. And then we'll do our final song before we go back to our science content here. Our non-musical science content. I'm still saying these are sharp. Hmm. Those are good, though. Yeah. And, uh... Why don't we do the Galaxy song? That's always a fun one. A little bit of a change of pace. But, uh, yeah, this is not a song that's explicitly about paleontology, but it does deal with large numbers. It deals with a kind of a scientific mindset, with what we can learn as, as scientists and what that tells us about our place in the universe. And, yeah, this is a uh, an excellent song play for anybody who might be having kind of a lousy day today. Maybe they're... I don't know. Just not having a great time of it. Maybe a bit of a pick-me-up. Maybe a bit of a change of perspective. So to them, I will sing. Just remember that you're standing on a planet that's evolving. Revolving at 900 miles an hour. It's orbiting at 90 miles a second, as though it's reckoned a sun that is the source of all our power. Now the sun and the sun and you and me and all the stars that we can see, they're moving in a million miles a day. In an outer spiral, I'm 13,000 light years wide of the galaxy we call the Milky Way. There we go. Our galaxy itself contains 200 billion stars. It's 100,000 light years side to side. It bulges in the middle, 13,000 light years thick, but out by us it's just 3,000 light years wide. Now we're 30,000 light years from galactic central point. We go round every 200 million years. And our galaxy is only one of millions of billions in our expand amazing and expanding universe. There we go.
keeps on expanding and expanding in all of the directions it can whiz as fast as it can go the speed of light you know 12 million miles a minute and that's the fastest speed there is though remember when you feel it very small and insecure how amazingly unlikely is your birth and pray that there's intelligent life somewhere up in space cause it's hard to find down here on earth there you go that's the Galaxy song. And thank you, thank you, everybody, for that incredible level 5 hype train earlier. Extraordinary. I am deeply grateful. Thank you very, very much for that incredible support. We have crushed our sub goal for the day. And it was a lofty one. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Holy cow. Good stuff. Yeah, and I'm glad you liked that. King of the Nerds, I'm glad you liked that one of our classic songs here. Let me change our streaming category real quick back to... Let's do uh, science and technology real quick, shall we? Not real quick. Let's change back to that category. And let's take a look at our 3D printer, because I'm hearing some strange sounds coming from it. Let's get a live view of that 3D printer. And let me go look at it in person, because there might be some prongs sticking up that I need to tamp down or something. No, we're good. We're good. Yeah. For anybody wondering, we are printing a life-size Allosaurus skull piece by piece. This is huge. It's This is going to be like three, over three feet long, like over a meter long. Life-size Allosaurus skull, which is going to make a wonderful addition so our other 3D printed dinosaurs here are baby T-Rex and our baby Triceratops. Our Protoceratops, Deinonychus, Camarasaurus, other baby Triceratops, Euclocephalus, Dilophosaurus over here, etc. etc. Allosaurus is gonna be uh that was gonna be a hefty one. I'm very excited for this. So yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah. Anywho, all of the rest of these 3D printed, most of them live on stream. Um, and our Allosaurus is going to take a long time because, man, it's going to be something like 900 hours of printing total. But I'm working on the lower jaw right now, and hopefully I can finish the lower jaw and the teeth and uh, and get that assembled before I leave for field work this summer and hopefully take you along with me to show you what it's like to dig up dinosaurs live on stream this summer. But yeah. 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 Uh, anyway. Good stuff. Now, we were just looking at an article about Mesozoic mammals. And I think... Did we just have a new video about that? Um... Hoping we do, because it'd be nice to be able to run to the bathroom real quick. Um, you know what? Let's let's take a look at this right here, and then we'll get into our T Rex stuff after this, or our no, sorry, our Siberian dinosaur nests, and then T Rex, and then our prehistoric planet two trailer. Wow, covering a lot of ground on today's stream. Take a look at this. I'm going to go run to the bathroom real quick. I'll be back in like 45 seconds. But uh, you all behave yourselves for this video talking about 
the rise of the mammals. The very late rise of the mammals. They'd already been around for like 180 million years or something like that before they uh, they actually really took off. It took the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs to do that, but here we go. Yeah. Over the past several months, we've taken you on a journey through geologic history one era at a time. If you haven't been on that trip with us yet, those videos, they're all down in a playlist below. And by now, you're probably tired of hearing us tell you that you're related to all of these bizarre organisms that look nothing like you. Like in the Mesozoic era, we introduced you to the Megazostrodon, a little insectivore that lived among the dinosaurs as one of the earliest known mammals. At least that's a mammal, so you can see the connection, right? But what about Dimetrodon? It lived in the era before the Mesozoic and the Paleozoic. It's not our direct ancestor, but it was a stem mammal, part of the group of animals that descended from reptiles to give rise to mammals. And when you look at it, well, it's not exactly like looking in a mirror, is it? By the time we follow our lineage back even farther to Lika, the ancestor of all eukaryotes, and Luca, the single-celled ancestor of everything that's alive today, we're talking about forms of life whose lives and structures we can only speculate about. But now you have arrived at the Cenozoic era, and in fact, you've always been there because that's the era that we're in now. And the Cenozoic is when many organisms took shapes and behaviors that you can actually recognize. Most of the mammals and birds that you can think of appeared during this era, and reptiles went through some surprising changes, but they eventually settled into the ranges that they inhabit today. But perhaps more importantly, for us at least, the Cenozoic marks the rise of organisms that look a lot like you and me. Okay, to be fair, if you had traveled back to the start of the Cenozoic era 66 million years ago, there would still be a lot that you would yeah. recognize. It was so warm that the whole world was full there we of go. tropical and subtropical forests, even at the poles. And for about the first 10 million years of the Cenozoic, the world was still recovering from the KPG extinction event that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs. Yep. That was the very beginning of the Paleogene period. And Not just the non-avian dinosaurs, but also... Shoot, what was it? Um, not just the non-avian dinosaurs, but 94% of the birds, about 20% of uh, amphibians like this, tailed amphibians, 20% of crocs, 40% of freshwater fishes, 22% of turtles, 92% of lizards and snakes, and 90% of mammals. Um, it's like, that wiped out almost everybody back then. Not just the non-avian dinosaurs, although the non-avian dinosaurs did go completely extinct. And it would be like 98% of dinosaurs species total, I guess. Um, if you don't, yeah, if we're counting birds as dinosaurs, which they are. Anyway. Continue. Wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs. Yeah. That was the very beginning of the Paleogene period, and the world was kind of empty. Along with the dinosaurs, almost all other large land vertebrates had vanished. Many yep. terrestrial plants were gone too, and in the oceans, the giant marine reptiles and even most of the plankton had disappeared. Because of yep. the scarcity Oof. of life, during this first chapter of this period, known as the Paleocene Epoch, there were plenty of open ecological niches, and the surviving forms of life began to fill them. The last remaining dinosaurs, birds, had begun to diversify into some pretty familiar forms. Yeah. Uh, King of the Nerds says, out of curiosity, how much eukaryotic life was wiped out in that event? I mean, most of your eukaryotic life is what? Microorganisms? And we don't have a good fossil record for microorganisms. So it's hard to say. But like most multicellular life it was something like 70 between 60 and 70 some people even say 80 percent of life on earth died out like numbers of species but yeah it's a lot it's a lot for example yeah. after many open ecological niches and the surviving forms of life began to fill them. The last remaining dinosaurs, birds, had begun to diversify into some pretty familiar forms. For example, around this time, we begin to see the likes of Waimanu, a small flightless water yep. bird from New Zealand that's one of the earliest known penguins. Likewise, in New Mexico, the appearance of Sidiazi tells us that the ancestors of mouse birds found today all huh. over Sub-Saharan Africa were already on the scene. Pretty Meanwhile, cool. The forest floor, yeah. some early ungulate-like mammals began to take over. Yeah. It was pretty easy because there weren't many predators. Any Omar Luna? 
how you doing? Welcome, welcome, Omar. mammals had survived the extinction, and it didn't take long for some of them to start developing a taste for bigger prey. These were the creodonts, predators that first appeared yep. in North America, like the small dog-like Galesion. Now they're totally gone, Oxiana, but they were big back then. Cat. For all an, an anonymous gifter. One sub to the king of the nerds. Thank you for that gift sub to king of the nerds. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, anonymous gifter. Appreciate it. One time, scientists thought that these small meat eaters were the direct ancestors of today's modern carnivores. But in recent years, we've learned that they actually are a separate lineage, one that only happened to converge on the same strategies and overall yep. body plans of the carnivores we know today. Now, other mammals made their homes. What's pretty wild is that when you're a mammal and you want to like evolve into something that's big and eat meat and eats meat, like chances are you'll evolve into something that looks very much like a lion, you know, like the creodonts do. Um, it's like being a mammal and already having that basic mammalian body plan where you've got four legs, you've got fur, you've got fleshy ears like that, and you've got, like, you know, uh, what we call heterodont teeth, where you've got canines in front, and then you've got premolars and molars and everything else. It's like, if you're going to evolve into a big predator, you're going to evolve into something that looks a lot like a lion. And we see this again and again and again. Uh, this convergent evolution, but how convergent is it really if you st already start off as a mammal, you know? It's like you're already nine-tenths of the way there. So, yeah. So, we're not going to turn into crabs? No! Stick in my rear. No, 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 no. That... So, only crustaceans turn into crabs, basically. Uh, yeah. So, here. This is, this is an interesting and, I think, important point to make. Yeah. Um... Carcinization. You've probably heard about this before. Uh, carcinization will blow your mind. What are... Th uh, this is short, at least. Let's see... Let's see what these guys have to say about this from something called Side Note Podcast. I'm guessing we're going to be... We're going to be talking about the... Well, yeah, we're going to be collect co correcting a lot of stuff in here. Let's check it out. This week... I learned about something called carcinization, which I did not know about. Have you ever heard about it? I've heard of Carson Cressley. Okay. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Drag race fan. Um, slash Queer Eye. Is that what he's from? So. I've never really watched drag racing either. Or stock car racing or. NASCAR. None of that. It's not interested in that. You know? Basically, yeah. it turns out that a crab-like physical form is perhaps one of the more optimal life forms because crustaceans have evidently evolved into crab-like forms five times independently. It's a bit well covered. I wonder if this guy is going to ruin it. But um, it, it the thing is, the thing about carcinization, like creatures keep evolving into a crab-like form. It's like, yeah, because they're already crustaceans. <laughs> they've already got jointed legs they've already got an exoskeleton they're already living in the ocean like that for that kind of creature this body plan is something that just it works so they kind of keep evolving into that same sort of body plan yeah. Oh, wow. That's cool. If you've cool. ever heard of convergent evolution, this is when yeah. a trait that is shared by different species has evolved separately. So they have... <laughs> This is really good. I'm impressed. Man, I thought this was going to be lousy. No, excellent. Yeah, so wings. The bats are mammals. Pterosaurs are reptiles, kind of related to dinosaurs. Birds evolved from dinosaurs. Each one of these independently evolved wings. And their wings look very different from each other. Bats, like their whole hand, turns into a wing. Here's something stranger than science fiction. Uh, Mazazazel. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Uh, pterosaurs, it's just their fourth finger that fin that forms that wing membrane. Their other fingers are right there. But it's also a skin membrane like it is in bats. Birds of old feathers, or other dinosaurs of old feathers, and birds inherited that. It's kind of an ev evolutionary hand-me-down. And they took those feathers and they turned them into a wing structure. That's convergent evolution. Unrelated groups of animals independently evolve a similar kind of deal. You know? Like wings.
this is an excellent example. Similar species, uh, similar features, but it doesn't mean that they yeah. have a common ancestor that has that uh, feature. Yep. That's so, so cool. Eyes are an example of this, so lots of different species are... And it, King of the Nerds says insects as well. Is there a common end point for insects like crabs? Uh, something that looks like a beetle. There's a lot of... There's, first of all, there's a ton of beetles, like 400,000 species of beetles, but they all come from a beetle ancestor. There are other groups of insects that also evolve to look like beetles that are not beetles. You know? Um, Yeah, so maybe like beetle form... Although that's such a broad category, like there's so many different kinds of beetles that look so different that I don't know if it's got the same kind of elegance to it, like uh, like saying, oh yeah, crab form. What is beetle form? There's so many different kinds of beetles, you know? So yeah, yeah. And welcome, Ice Clap. How you doing? Howdy, howdy. So yeah. Yeah, anyway, continue. Uh, even from like cephalopods to vertebrates from, to nadarians have sort of sensors, but they develop separately. They're not all sharing a common ancestor. Things like echo. Mysterious. Rhodey, thank you for that follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Location in wats and whales. <laughs> what? What? Whales what? and bats have evolved separately, <laughs> and flight in birds, insects. Uh, pterosaurs and bats Th those are examples of convergent evolution huh. this is the uh, i'm impressed this is they're handling this really well wow. so carcinization he's handling it really well tendency for crustaceans to look like crabs and that there are lots of creatures that you might see that look like crabs that are actually not crabs because over time they're they have yep. evolved towards this form because it's i guess one of the most like i mean i get you you get to move around you get to have your little piercers yeah, you got, like, like weapons it seems you're, protected like, lots of shells like, i need a shell so even i'm going to show you this picture and hopefully it'll come <laughs> up on the screen the none of these are uh, okay wait I'll so yeah is that right none of these are crabs Show you this picture and hopefully it'll come up on the screen. The none of these <gasps> are crabs. Okay, wait. So this, I'm glad we're talking about this because this is like this is something really really important in biological science. Not one of these is a crab, and uh, Basil says that the one in the middle is a lobster. I think. Now they are decapods. They've got ten limbs, right? I think. So they're that group of crustaceans, but none of these are crabs. This itself might be a lobster. I don't know. Somebody can look up the original publication here because this is a figure from a scientific paper. And these all, if you saw these on the beach, you'd go, oh, yeah, dude, that's that's a crab. That's a crab, dude. No, none of these are crabs. Because that's the thing. The way that we as scientists classify living things it's not like pointing at it and going, oh, that's a crab, because it looks like a crab. No, each of these evolved from an ancestor that was not a crab. And they've all, like, independently converged on this form that looks like crab to us. But each one of these comes from a different ancestor that was not a crab. And in science, the way that we actually classify living things, it's not by looking at it and going, oh, it looks like a this. So I'll call it that. It's got big claws in front, so I'll call it crab. That's not how it works. We actually look at the ancestry of these animals. We study their evolution. We basically try and, through various modes of study, go back in time to kind of trace their ancestry. That is how we classify living things. Through their ancestry, you know? phylogenetics like building a family tree and actually figuring out who did evolve into whom what are the actual evolutionary relationships here that's why none of these are crabs because they didn't evolve from a crab these are different creatures that very badly want to be you know the want to be I'm anthropomorphizing these in a way that's very like unscientific but um they're kind of natural selection is shaping them into the same kind of body form very similar to true crabs does that make sense i hope it does yeah 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 and horseshoe crabs are something totally different you find yeah horseshoe crabs genus limulus they're like a totally different type of organism but we call them crabs i guess 
Again, that's why we use scientific names, is because when you just say crab, it's not very precise. Anybody on the street, you know, any uh, Jane Doe or Homer Sapiens who uh, sees one of these critters, they go, oh yeah, that's a crab. But they're not, they're not actually true crabs. They're not part of that taxonomic group. They didn't evolve from that ancestor. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And stink, absolutely. We've talked about horseshoe crabs. Genus Limulus. Limulus is their genus name. We've talked about them many times. We t could talk about them again, but I don't want to get too sidetracked here. Yeah. All I have to say, okay, that is wild that none of those are crabs. What? Well, they are, so they're called porcelain crabs, these ones in particular. Huh. Um, and they resemble crabs, but they're more closely related to uh, a type of lobster. Yep. Oh, wow. And so even Basil, you said lobster, right? With huge legs. Yeah. They obviously look mostly like crabs, but they have come from a lineage of hermit crabs. So they huh. wouldn't have even had, they would have found their own shells previously in their lineage. They share a common ancestor with hermit crabs, but they've developed and evolved over time to have a, the shape. This guy's great. I appreciate this. More like a crab. Shout out wow. to him. Wow. Also, that is a beautiful photo and it should be painted. And yeah, porcelain uh, crabs. I'm so freaking bored. Maybe I'll paint it. Um, in um, a way, they call them false crabs because. Uh, false crabs. Like, there you go. Like yeah. Rude. <laughs> yeah. Why do crabs get to be the number one that we all like? Can compare other crab like creatures to a crab uh. because i guess the crabs in their lineage just are like genuinely what we call crabs they're also probably the most speciose they're probably the most diverse group there's probably the most species of true crabs and so everything else that comes along that looks like that they get to be the false crabs because these guys were first you know i don't know naming conventions when it comes to like uh, when it comes to common names like that, get all screwy. That's why we have scientific names to reduce the confusion. You know? Yeah. And then other creatures. I'm all right, I'll see you in a minute, Lenina. Thank you. I forgot to tell you, um, I have crabs. crabs. <laughs> I'm kidding. I wonder if they're also like, yep, we have the optimal form. <laughs> yeah. Um, Honestly. Yeah, I just thought that was really no, that's different. Pubic lice are a totally different thing. Who knew that crabs would take over the world? Yeah. Is screwy a scientific term? You'd be surprised at the number of times you hear that from a scientist. Fuck, Ninja, yeah. So that's the thing, too, is that, like, shoot. I feel like... That's one of the reasons why I do this. You know, every weekday in a normal week. I know this week we didn't do that. But let's do a Google image search for scientist right here. Like, I think most people in the general public, when they think about a scientist, they picture somebody in a white coat in a sterile laboratory looking very serious. Or maybe, maybe they're like a mad scientist, you know? But anyway, it's going to be very serious, very precise. But the thing is, we, as scientists, we, we strive to be precise in our language, but we're human beings, you know? And we are... There are many, many different kinds of scientists. Different personality types, different, like, archetypes of people. And there was a, a lovely tweet about this the other day, and I'm going to see if I can find it for you. Um, where was that? Um, there we go. Yeah! Yeah! Uh, scientists are people of very dissimilar temperaments, doing different things in very different ways. Among scientists are collectors, classifiers, and compulsive tidiers up. Many are detectives by temperament, and many are explorers. Some are artists, and others artisans. There are poet scientists and philosopher scientists, and even a few mystics. Yeah. I actually need to read this whole article. That... It sounds like good stuff. But scientists, we're human beings, and we've got... It's almost like there are as many different ways of being a scientist as there are different scientists. Maybe not. There's a lot of scientists in the world, but you know what I mean. We're a diverse group of people. And we use words like screwy, you know, for certain things. Like, cause certain groups of animals, it's just... They're weird. They're screwy. They're all... 
They're all kapikahe, as my grandfather would say. You know? It's just... Yeah. You know? This idea of, like, the stayed and stolen scientist, you know, working in a laboratory and, you know, very unemotional, dispassionate. Yes, I must do my work. I will transfer things from this beaker into the next. In my experience, scientists aren't like that. We're passionate people with a lot of different personality types. Your archetypical view of a scientist. There will be a few people who adhere to that, sure, but most scientists aren't like that, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Miss Yvette says, how can an artist be a scientist? Well, what do you mean, Miss Yvette? What do you mean? Well, here, I'll show you. In fact, here. I retweeted this earlier. <laughs> this is by uh, by Bobby Bosenacker, Whaleyontologist. Bobby himself, consummate scientist, but he does he does artwork not just on the side, but he does artwork to you know reconstruct the animals that he describes. He works on fossil whales, and. Uh, yeah, here are uh, our four species of fossil whale that he was working on there. Yeah. Um, Bobby does a ton of artistic work, too. And his artwork gets published in his own papers and in the papers of his colleagues. And, yeah, he does a lot of artwork just for fun also, you know? Um, yeah, he's an excellent artist. He really, really is. And, uh... Yeah, let me scroll down. Let's see. Looking, looking, looking. Um, yep. Here's some of Bobby's art here. A small sampling of his art. He does a lot of, like, marine species and stuff. But yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I do artwork myself. You know? I do sculpting. I do painting sketching you know a big part of especially being a paleontologist if you're describing new taxa new species new genera you know, you're looking at at the morphology of bones you have to be able to see things and that same kind of seeing noticing the subtle differences between the bone of say the dentary of this species of whale and the dentary of that species of whale it requires a kind of specialized eye You've got to train your eyes to see those subtle differences, to, to feel them. And that's the same kind of eye that an artist has, you know? Art and science intertwined like that in ways that I think a lot of people don't realize. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um... Anyway, and F Richard Feynman played the bongos. Yeah, famous physicist played the bongos. Does that count as art? Probably paid actor. I don't know. I'm not a musician. Any musicians here in chat? Does playing the bongos count as art? I would presume it probably would be. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Good stuff. Tom Scott and the Library of Rare Colors. What is that, King of the Nerds? Um, let's see. Hmm. Wait, what? I feel like we should check this out. I've never seen this before. I work with computers and digital video a lot, which means that I think of color in terms of light, in terms of amounts of red, green, and blue. Someone who works with print might think of color in terms of combining inks, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Yeah. A physicist might think in terms of the frequencies and wavelengths of the light. But there is a very different way to look at it, through the chemistry and compounds that make up colors. Oh, and cool. Those buildings, very cool. Art museums is the Forbes Pigment Collection. The Pigment huh. Collection 
was put together. Oh, this is super neat. Forbes, who is the second director of the museum. He'd been buying works of art, and in doing so, he discovered that the dealers in Italy were seeing American collectors as something of a mark. What he decided is that if you understand what a work of art is made of, what the original materials were that an artist used, then you can tell original from restoration, original from fake. And Very so cool. what he did was yeah. start buying pigments to use as standards for the analysis of works of art. Knowing oh, that's that super neat. The public meant that I needed to make some sense of what we have as a collection. So what I did was take... So yeah, this is... This does kind of deal with that same, I don't know, where art meets science, I suppose. Yeah, isn't this cool? Color wheel, open it out. I have yellow in the center, and we go along one way to blue, along the other way to red. Very and neat. Purple at each end. So we have unique colors along the top. We have duplicates of those colors, which are chemical duplicates, but not actual color duplicates. And then underneath on the bottom shelf, we have the raw material that makes up the colors above. Oh, and that's super cool. Wow. That make up paint next to each other. And then if people look at the galleries below, they can actually see what artists can do with these raw materials. If you think <laughs> about iron oxide, for example, hematite, but as it forms in the earth, those slight additions that the earth adds into the hematite deposits, that allow it to look slightly different. So we have 60 different samples of hematite. Each of those is a slightly different shade from the other. These pigments are not used for restoration. We use them only as standards for analyzing samples from work. That's pretty cool. By That's pretty cool. materials, we yeah. can understand the thinking process. And if the artist is no longer alive, it's really the closest way to having an interview with the artist. It's also That's really neat. Teaching. We can show students yeah. how pigments change. They not just fade, but some pigments darken. That's like Vaseline, but 80 years old. It doesn't last <laughs> forever. Vermilion red lead will turn black on exposure to light. You can see how it started. And then other pigments like eosin, which Van Gogh used a lot, will fade and give an entirely different impression of what the <laughs> painting was to what it looks like now. And so for security, huh. we don't have the public in here. Some of the pigments are toxic, so we don't want people touching yeah. and playing with Shoot, yeah, yeah. I remember. What was it called? There was a, it wasn't Bakelite, that was the plastic, but there was a kind of a, a radioactive, uh, pigment that was used in a, a really popular kind of ceramic. Uh, yeah. Fiesta wear. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. Um, yeah, take a look at this. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, it's not that radioactive. Uh, but, uh... Fiesta Ware, an Art Deco ceramic glaze dinnerware, was manufactured and marketed by Homer Laughlin China Company <laughs> of Newell, West Virginia. Uh, original shape and glazes were designed by Homer's art director, Frederick Hurton Reed. When Fiesta Ware was first produced, it only came yep. in five colors. Red, orange red, blue, cobalt, green, light green, yellow, deep gold, and old ivory, a yellowish cream. Huh. To achieve the bright yellow, red, orange color, uranium oxide was added to the glaze. Uranium oxide. So they used uranium oxide in order to achieve that color right there. It's a beautiful color. It really is. And it's got a certain kind of like depth and subtlety to it. And the way that it kind of like, it, it looks very natural. It doesn't, it's not a paint or anything. It's like, well, I guess it's a glaze, but something about it is just really nice. The way that it kind of grades from light to dark like this, that subtlety in it is beautiful. But yeah. When baked to glaze up and make an orange color. In 1944, this glaze was discontinued due to confiscations of the uranium for the Manhattan Project. 
Ah. Uh, oh, holy cow. <laughs> so they couldn't make the plates anymore because the radioactive material, the uranium, was instead being used to make nuclear weapons. That's why they discontinued it. It's like, nope. Yoink. We need this material. <laughs> Don't use this for making, you know, stuff that people are going to eat off of. For kitchenware, you know. Uh, plates that ki kids are going to be licking clean. Don't use it for that. We're going to use it to make nuclear weapons instead. From a nuclear warhead. Oh, boy. In 1959, the orange fiesta ware was continued, but now it used depleted uranium instead of naturally occurring uranium. Ah. Uh. Depleted uranium and naturally occurring oxide are different. The difference between yep. depleted uranium and naturally occurring uranium is that uranium that is naturally occurring contains uranium-235. Oh, yeah. But it's radioactive isotopes. The 235 removed. Yeah. So the 235, oh boy, that's the really volatile stuff. That's what's going to give you radiation poisoning. Five is what's responsible for detonation and fission in a yep. nuclear warhead or a nuclear reactor. Yep. Red Fiesta Ware is not the only Fiesta Ware produced that has radioactive material in its glaze. Another huh. color that contains radioactive material is ivory. Ah. Uh, in 19 The two coolest colors. All the use of depleted That's a shame. Yeah. In Fiesta Ware. So don't stack too many of those plates together. I mean, shoot, if a piece of it chipped off and got in your food, like you could get really sick. Um, if you're just eating food off of it, you'll probably be okay. But like, if a piece of that glaze, a little, you know, shard, a little fleck, a little chip of it, gets into your food and you ingest it and you have that in your body, you could get seriously sick. Fair. Yeah. All fiesta ware produced today has no radioactive materials put into the glaze. Yeah. Examinations of some plates revealed that it could be up to 14% uranium by weight. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Different colors can be uh can be radioactive. Manhattan, Nevada. This is the Manhattan project, isn't it? Yeah, shoot. With them so pigments are made of mercury, they're made of cadmium, arsenic, uh. and the oldest white pigment is lead white. It's made uh. by taking lead metal, putting it into a container with vinegar. That container is buried in cow dung. So out of manure, you get the most pure, beautiful white pigment. That's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. People use it. Uh, S.P. Harkins says, my grandfather made, said his steel mill made uranium ingots for the Manhattan Project, and a lot of people wound up dying. Oh, I'm sorry, S.P. Harkins. Jeez. Yeah, dangerous materials. But it's makeup. Know? Lead white yeah. is toxic in the way that lead is toxic. <laughs> We have mummy brown. It has been used probably since the 17th century, and it's made up of Egyptian mummies that have been ground up into pigment. Indian yellow is an interesting really? pigment. It's made That's by nuts. feeding cows mango leaves only and collecting their urine and drying their urine. What you see on the screen depends on the limitations of what the computer screen can depict. So videoing them, putting them into yeah. the digital format, doesn't replicate the color. There is innovation Maybe and is people insane. are developing That's, that is crazy, new ways Ninja, yeah. to depict colors. So for example, Mass Subramanian developed a blue pigment called Yin Min Blue. He discovered it by accident. It's very stable. And it's the first inorganic blue pigment that's been invented for a couple of hundred years. There's huh. been a new black that's come onto the market, which is Vanta Black, which stands for vertically arranged nanotube arrays. Yeah. <laughs> This is a kind of black that is so black that it just like absorbs light and it almost becomes not invisible, but like it's almost difficult to see at a distance because it just doesn't reflect light rays for your eyes to pick up. It's really, really nuts. It reminds me like it's it's like um it's like those creatures from uh from that movie Attack the Block, you know? Um yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, it's like uh it's almost like these critters from here. Where like what a cool creature design by the way. Um Yeah. Where they're just they're just black, you know? 
Um, here, they're chasing, uh, chasing them through here, aren't they? Where did that go? Shoot. Anyway, we don't really have a... Yeah, they're just black, you know? Just... It's like they absorb all of the light. Which I suppose would make things a lot easier for the effects team, but it's also a really effective creature design. Like, holy moly. But yeah, that's what Vanta Black is like, I think. This right here, yeah. Very tiny tubes and light will go into that. It will bounce around inside the, the tubes and then get uh, issued as heat. It's a beautiful velvety There you go, basically, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't bounce any light back. Chemists produce more and more pigments every year. And I think that we're going to see pigments depicting colors that we never thought were possible. Every day, <laughs> somebody is coming in here, taking a pigment out and using that as a reference. This was beautifully arranged when I installed it. It took me like four months of lining everything up. Wow. And it's all a little higgledy piggledy now. So you can tell that we use it all the time. It's not <laughs> an historic artifact. It's something that we rely on to do our work properly. That's well, very cool. At the Harvard Art Museum's pull down the description. Really, really neat. Yeah. So that's just one example and almost kind of a, almost a too obvious example of art and science. Uh, kind of commingling there. But, yeah, yeah. Here, let's take a look at this. Science Today from the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. I'm going to be doing some work here over the next month. Art and science have a long history together. Yeah. Art and architecture and scientific illustration, they were all part of the same process of trying to discover and, and explain the world around us. Oh, yeah. How art yeah. and science intersect for me, at least, is allowing the visual excitement of a piece draw somebody in, and then the science providing that informative aspect and then all of a sudden seeing how the relationship changes because they have that extra bit of information about something. Because my field is so visual in its essence, we're comparing things, and for me that means yep. comparing living things. I do a lot of... Oh, those are crinoids there. Holy cow, did you see those? Yeah, crinoids. So this is a group of living things that goes back, like, what, close to 500 million years? They're kind of echinoderm. They're related to, like, sea stars, starfish, and uh, and sea urchins and stuff like that. But they're still around today. They're they're all throughout the fossil record. You find crinoids all over the place. But um, they're not completely extinct. There's still a bunch around today, and here's some footage of them. Really cool. I do a lot of illustrating. I do some photography, but I can never get quite the message I want to commit to the audience without making some drawings. Yep. And this is a theme that you'll see again and again in science is that photography is wonderful. But if you really want to communicate a certain idea about the morphology of an organism to an audience, you want to do it visually, you got to make an illustration. You know, stuff gets lost in photographs. But if you can draw a diagram and just call attention to the things that you really want them to understand, that's what illustrations are wonderful for, you know? So yeah. Mechaholic. Thank you for the 21 months of support, Mechaholic. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. 21 months is a long time. I appreciate you keeping me on the air for this long, Mechaholic. Thank you very much. So yeah, yeah. And uh, the true life color might not highlight what you want to express exactly, Rizudego, or sometimes just a photograph of like a specimen that's been in a in a museum and collections for a long time. It might fade. You need to use some artistic expression in order to actually portray what it would look like in life. You know? Yeah. As the saying goes, a picture tells a thousand words. Images are a great way to complement a written description of, of, say, a plant. Yep. It may not be a very beautiful plant with big showy flowers, but a drawing of it, making small things large and yep. drawing things in a very pleasing way can make an illustration that is also a piece of art. Very cool. 
Yeah. For those of us that have a real passion for science and natural history, finding beauty within that, emphasizing certain features, the idea of recreating reality is totally elusive and it never really exists. Our expression is in the details that we choose to emphasize and the way yep. that we choose to depict what we're illustrating. What a wonderful video. This is lovely. A great scientific illustrator knows how to extract and separate those things that need to get conveyed in the illustration. <laughs> if the illustration is aesthetically appealing as well as full of information, they're going to dwell on it long enough to get that extra thing that you're hoping they're going to learn. There I you go. Inspiration from the natural yeah. world. And the more I got into that, the more I started asking myself questions. Well, how does that work? Or why does that work? Or how come these are here together? Once I got to learn more about it, that became what was really inspiring and inspirational for me. It's not just about how it looks, but really how everything works together. The natural world is a source of inspiration for any human being on this planet. As creative as an artist can be, you can't top the creativity in nature. <laughs> yeah. Evolution, a wonderful creative... <laughs> creative uh, uh, process of force there. So yeah, that's how science and art intersect like that. And um, yeah, yeah, it's... Once you spend enough time in the sciences, you kind of get it. You know? Hopefully you kind of get it now, too. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, many crinoid fossil stock donuts. Yeah, the little segments there, Golganek. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Now. We might actually have to... Well, shoot. We were talking about... Mammals, but we went too far afield from that. You know what? We might have to continue some of these subjects tomorrow or even Monday. Take some of the things that we said that we were going to uh, that we were going to talk about on today's stream, like this. Like how many T Rex lived during the reign of their species? How many T Rex? How does anagenesis complicate that? We might have to talk about that on Monday. Dinosaur nesting behavior. We've had so many other things on this stream. Let's continue with the art and science aspect right here. And let's, as promised, no, as promised uh, right here, uh, let's watch the trailer for Prehistoric Planet 2. Which came out, I think, on Tuesday, the first day of my hiatus this week. I have very specifically, stalwartly, patiently waited. I have refrained from watching the trailer for Prehistoric Planet 2. Specifically because I wanted to share it with all of you. Let's watch it one time all the way through here. It's just a minute. And we'll go by point by point the second time around and we'll talk about these different critters. The prehistoric planet is a phenomenal, phenomenal, exquisite marriage of art and science. An intermingling of these disciplines. I, the first season just absolutely blew me away. Exactly what a paleontologist wants to see on a streaming service like Apple Plus TV or whatever it's called. A wonderful depiction of the Mesozoic world for a general audience. It made me so happy, and it makes my life easier as a science communicator for there to be really authentic, beautiful, engaging depictions of dinosaurs and their contemporaries. That was season one. Let's take a look at season two right here. Again, I promise you I've not watched this. I saw maybe a few GIF images of some dancing as darkened pterosaurs on Twitter. That's it. I've purposefully stayed away from this. Let's take a look. There they are. Yeah. This makes me so happy. Holy cow. 
The astounding nature of our planet has only begun to be revealed, but there's always more to learn and more to discover. Yeah, there is. Five, <laughs> oh. Five new worlds filled with Ooh. more adventure, more danger, and more dinosaurs. Yeah. Get ready for prehistoric planet. Ah! Only on Apple TV Plus. Very nice. May twenty second. You better believe that we're going to be having some special streams after those episodes come out, and we'll be covering them. Uh, it'll come out, you know, the night before, and then we'll we'll talk about it that day. Very excited. Very very excited. So uh, let's go back to the beginning and let's take a look at these critters one by one. I recognize some of these animals. I think. I thought I saw the that Alaskan Tyrannosaur, Nanaxaurus, as it's often called. Let's take a look. This is a big ol' Asdarkid Pterosaur. Uh, we saw Quetzalcoatl in season one. These are truly huge flying creatures. Among the largest flying animals that have ever lived. You know, with their wings folded up, walking on the ground, they're about this big compared to a... Uh, a human man. Just extraordinary. You know? Yeah. And yeah, Dark Raven, season two is going to be great, I think. Yes. So this is, uh, this is kind of the last hurrah of the pterosaurs. Pterosaurs are big flying reptiles. Not all of them are big. Some of them were small. But these are only the second group of creatures to ever evolve flight. It went insects... Back in what, the Carboniferous, something like that? Then pterosaurs during the Triassic period. These guys lived alongside the dinosaurs. Then you get birds in the Jurassic, and then you get bats in the Paleogene. Flight has only ever evolved four times on planet Earth. Uh, natural flight in living things. Insects, pterosaurs, birds, and bats. Pterosaurs are number two, and they got their biggest in the Cretaceous. With big Azadarkids like uh, like Quetzalcoatlus here, and this might be Hatsagopteryx or something similar. It seems to me like Prehistoric Planet Two is also probably set in the Mastrichtian, at the end of the age, very very end of the age of dinosaurs, right before the asteroid hits, from about seventy to about sixty six million years ago. So like the last four million years or so. Yeah. Uh, and look at these critters, beautiful. And I think that is supposed to be some sexual dimorphism between the male and the female. Female, and then male with as much brighter, larger, more showy crest like that. Interesting. I'm not an expert on pterosaurs, but I do think... I think we actually have evidence for sexual dimorphism in pterosaurs, don't we? Unlike in dinosaurs. Pretty cool. Yeah... The astounding nature of our planet has only begun to be revealed. But so this is like a courtship display between these animals. Very cool. There's always more to learn. It's just beautiful, you know? That's one of the things that I really like about Prehistoric Planet is that it's not showing these dinosaurs and pterosaurs and other creatures as being monsters. It shows them as being animals, like they really would have been, you know? Uh, and sometimes they, it can be kind of scary or gross or nasty. And sometimes they're really, truly beautiful like this. Just like modern animals. Oh, I love it. And more yeah. Yeah. And who is that? This, I see this is a little Deinonica sort. This is going to be a troodontid, isn't it? Catching a bird right there. So one of the most bird-like dinosaurs catching a bird. See that that uh, digit two claw right there? Yeah, digit one, two, three, and four. That's going to be a little troodontid. Leaping up and catching a bird. Very similar to troodon, yes, indeed. Yeah, more troodontids. Very nice. Yeah. And Dark Raven, 
uh, pteranodons, spe specifically pteranodon. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Pteranodon, now known to be sexually di sec sexually dimorphic, the males and the females having different morphology, different shapes to their crests and stuff. Very cool. El Bacalas is the one in the volcano is Isosaurus, which doesn't get nearly enough attention. Isosaurus, one of the best known sauropod dinosaurs from India and Pakistan, I think. It's cool that we're actually going to get to see that. Yeah. yeah. Five epic nights. And that, holy cow, hang on. This might be like a baby velociraptor or something. Very cute. But this looks, looks like a Hesperornithid bird right there. Very nice, like Hesperornis. When people ask me, Danny, Danny, I'm, I'm new to stream. What's your favorite ocean dinosaur? I go, well, Hesperornis, I guess. Because all of the creatures that they think of as ocean dinosaurs are actually Mesozoic marine reptiles. Ichthyosaurs, Mosasaurs, Plesiosaurs, etc. But this is actually a real marine dinosaur. This is a kind of bird. Uh, a Hesperornithid, and man, this is cool. So yeah, Hesperornis. This is not going to be Hesperornis proper, because Hesperornis is from earlier in time. It's from like 90 million years ago. But I guess we've got Hesperornithid birds that are more recent than that. Yeah, these are ancient uh, swimmy birds like this. They probably swam with their legs kind of out to the sides like a modern loon. They may not have even been capable of walking on land. Um... There's a pteranodon, I guess, scooping up a fish before the Hesperornithids can get to it. But, uh, yeah. Legit ocean dinosaurs, Hesperornithids. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Five epic nights. And there is our little baby Velociraptor, or similar kind of Dromaeosaur, I betcha. Yeah, probably bumping into mom or dad there. Oof. Yeah. And look at the detailing there. Holy cow. Those scales. Beautiful. Uh, probably dad. This is probably dad's hind limb right here. Um, if uh, these dinosaurs are anything like their, their modern relatives, you know, quote-unquote primitive birds... Uh, what we used to call ratites, ostriches, emus, cassowaries, uh, tinamous. It's the the male, the the father, the dad, who actually takes care of the young. And I wonder if they're going to have that here for for these guys, which this is presumably a baby velociraptor. Very cool. Float U three two says that's a chicken. Float U three two. I've got news for you about velociraptor. It did not look like it did in the Jurassic World movies. Jurassic World... Jurassic World lied to you. Velociraptor didn't look like that. Velociraptor would have looked much more... like this. Or, uh... Or like this, right here. Um... Actually, would have been a lot more dangerous, I guess, in the sense that, like, here, here's if they actually were responsible with Jurassic World and gave their Velociraptors feathers like they should have. It would look like this, you know. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. And yeah, you would not want to be on the business end of those claws, Charlie's Dragon, because it would stand on top of you and flap its wings as you struggle to generate lift to press you into the ground as its claws go into you and then it starts eating you while you're still alive, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Paid Actor says, do the raised digit of dromaeosaurids occur on other extinct or living species? They do, Paid Actor, they do. Um, not just dromaeosaurids, but also critters like, uh, like troodontids close relatives of dromaeosaurs. These guys also had that raised digit two claw. Uh, like this. Not quite as hypertrophied. Not quite as dramatic. Yeah, but there's... Uh, you can call this Troodon if you want to. 
And it's got something very similar going on with its second toe claw. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Float says, I thought they were way smaller than that last picture. Um... Velociraptor itself is not particularly big. So... It's a Velociraptor skull right here. You know, not a huge animal. Not huge at all. About six feet long from the tip of its snout to the back of its tail. And maybe a third to half of that is tail, you know? So it's about the size of a large dog. But there are other species from the same family, what we call dromaeosaurids, that would have been much larger. So the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park isn't actually Velociraptor at all. For a number of reasons. It's it's Deinonychus. But, um... There are other members of this family that got much larger. Like right here. Yeah. You know, some of them are small, like Microraptor. There's Velociraptor right there. Here's Austroraptor, Utah Raptor, still the biggest of the dromaeosaurs that we know about right now, Utah Raptor. Also one of the earliest. Um, it's interesting. This the group actually seems to decrease in size over time. Although we've got so such so few examples that like is that really significant statistically. But anyway, yeah. Uh, the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park is actually this animal over here, Deinonychus. Right there. Who's also not huge. They, like, upscaled the Deinonychus for Jurassic Park. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um. So, yeah. Yeah. It's too darn big, says Makeaway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there was a cut Pachycephalosaurus bit in the trailer. Should I send you a clip? Please do, Six Foot Turkey. That'd be great. Yeah. Here, let's get back to our trailer here. With our little baby, potentially, Velociraptor. Yeah. Oh. Five new worlds. Ooh, and we've got more Plesiosaurus here. Oh, I do love me some of these four flippered long necks. This might even be an elasmosaur. I think they are elasmosaurs. Very cool. Filled with more uh, adventure. And there, I think, might have been our is this the our same Nanoxaurus from uh from Alaska, like in the last one? It looks like it. Yeah, we don't actually have much fossil material from this animal. But uh we know it's a tyrannosaur. And very well may have had feathers, especially if it's living in the snow like this, you know? Yeah. And chasing some ornithomimids, also coated with feathers. More adventure, more danger. And hang on, who is this? Another little Manoraptorin, a little Deinonychosaur. You can see those, those uh, Manoraptorin wrists and those Digit 2 claws. You just... Scooping up those bugs. You get those bugs. More danger and more. And we've got more of these as dark and pterosaurs. Beautiful. Dinosaurs. And that was that looked like Tyrannosaurus right there. Is this Quetzalcoatlus having a showdown with Tyrannosaurus? More, more adventure, more danger, and more time. Quetzalcoatlus. Tyrannosaurus. Holy cow. Yeah. And shoot, that was a frog. I think this is Bale Zabufo, like we saw earlier. Like, as far as we know, one of the largest frogs that's ever lived. Just spooking a sauropod dinosaur. Maybe Rapidosaurus or somebody? Some sort of like Malagasy uh, Titanosaur, maybe? <laughs> Get ready for prehistoric planet. Yeah. Only on Apple TV Plus. Very cool stuff. Oh, I can't wait. We are going to be having some special prehistoric planet streams when that comes out. Uh, yeah. May twenty third. Mark your calendars. 
Oh, and somebody do the, the free thing. I bet you Apple TV Plus still has that free promotion thing. So you can sign up for it right when that comes out, and you can watch all those for free. You don't have to pay a dime. Check it out there. Yeah. And Dark Raven says, Repeatosaurus, yes. It, really? That was just a guess on my part. Very cool. Yeah. Uh. But yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. And somebody was asking, uh, Quetzalcoatlus and Tyrannosaurus, aren't they from two different formations? I mean, they are, but... Quetzalcoatlus, I think, might be the only North American large Asdarkid that we have so far. And given how mobile those animals were, it's pretty likely... Ugh. Is Quetzalcoatlus from the Ojo Alamo formation? I know we've got material from it in Texas. Um... Yeah, but, um, do we have any Tyrannosaur mater Tyrannosaurus material from the same formation? I bet you we do. You'll find Rex teeth all over the place. Um, yeah, let's see. The Havelina Formation at Big Bend National Park. And I bet you... I bet you we've got Tyrannosaurus material from there. Uh, yep. Tyrannosaurus. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excuse me. As far as we know, there's only one really big Tyrannosaur from the end of the Cretaceous in North America. From the Mastrictian of North America. And so Tyrannosaurus and Quetzalcoatlus would have met each other, yeah. Yeah. Um... So anyway, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Uh, and Float says, what is the most holy grail of paleontologists? What would everyone like to find? It depends who you talk to. Uh, Float, it's a good question. Because uh, different paleontologists work on different kinds of creatures. They work in different areas. There are almost as many different kinds of paleontologists as there are different paleontologists, you know? Um, yeah. So, like, a dinosaur person is going to have a very different answer from somebody who studies fossil forams or uh, fossil ferns or something like that, you know? I would really, really like to find wonderful to find a North American Spinosaur. That would be pretty cool. It'd also be very cool to find, like, the earliest dinosaur. The ancestor of Eoraptor, perhaps, or something like that. The common ancestor of all dinosaurs. That would be pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Also, maybe rivaling that in terms of coolness would be the very, very, very first bird. Which is tricky, because it's like, how do you actually know it is the first bird? How do you actually know it is the first dinosaur back in the Triassic? There's going to be gray areas. But to be able to find a really, really cool, relatively complete, very diagnostic, well-preserved, morphologically informative specimen. And then have people study that for a hundred years into the future and go, yep, this is the first one. It's the ancestor of all the birds. Or that's the ancestor of all the dinosaurs, you know? That's pretty close to a holy grail. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be pretty neat. Conrad says, four amps for the win. There, see, Conrad knows what's up. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Actually, Havelinus, there probably are Golgonek. Havelinus, the, those poor sign mammals? Yeah. Yeah. And a rat tight like pterosaur is your dream fossil. So a, a totally undiscovered group of animals, six foot turkey. That'd be pretty neat. Yeah. I remember back in 2012, when I was leaving with Denver Fowler and John Scanella to go work in the Hell Creek Formation, yeah. I said, The dinosaurs became extinct because they no longer knew how to love each other. I didn't say this. Is that correct? Exactly. And I 
certainly wouldn't want our species to end the same way. <laughs> no, so, no, that's true. As often as I would like, but every time I'm here is gonna be a geek time less than three, less than three. Thank you, thank you, Nodasfu. I appreciate you. And I appreciate your eight months of support. Holy cow, thank you for keeping me here online for that long. That is truly excellent. And I appreciate you for it. Good stuff. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Back leaving for the Hell Creek formation with uh, Denver Fowler and John Scanella. I remember, like, cornering John and kind of jokingly asking him, like, John, what do you want me to find? in the Hell Creek for you. It's gonna be my first summer in the Hell Creek. John, what do you want me to find? What do you want me to find for you? And John said, Danny, find me a baby Taurosaurus. I thought it was a really interesting answer because then it's, it'd be like, then his hypothesis about Taurosaurus being an adult Triceratops would be neatly falsified. It was interesting that John said that. Um, yeah. Again, good scientist. Uh, and I said, nah, that would be cool, but you know what would be even cooler, John? As I said, let me find you a terrestrial elasmosaur that used its hyper-elongate neck to... Uh, constrict land prey like a boa constrictor and then swallow it whole. Completely unprecedented. Completely off the wall. Wacky. Such a thing couldn't exist. But I, I thought that was funny. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of, uh, I guess I was thinking of this. Um... I was thinking of this. <laughs> the Jurassic Park Tanistrophius. <laughs> uh, yeah. From 1993. Wow. Yeah, these animals, their necks were actually very stiff. Because they only have a few vertebrae in the necks. They couldn't bend like that. But I was thinking this, but for an elasmosaur, which would have had a slightly more... Uh, Slightly more flexible neck. But anyway, I thought that was fun. Joys of speculative evolution. Exactly, six foot turkey, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Well, we had so many raids today that we didn't even really get a chance to talk about this T-Rex thing. We'll probably talk about that on Monday, actually. Because I'm also going to be talking, I think, about the dinosaur auctions thing. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, we did have the triumphant return of paleontologizing today. Back where we should be. Safe and sound on dry land. Yeah. And I guess we'll talk about this on uh, Monday, too. But tomorrow, tomorrow, everybody, we're going to have an extra special stream. And yes, I mean tomorrow, as in Saturday, we're having an extra special paleontologizing stream tomorrow on Saturday. A weekend stream. Unheard of, right? But to make up for my hiatus this week, we're going to be streaming tomorrow. And we're going to be talking about... State dinosaurs. And we're going to be ranking them. Making a tier list of U.S. state dinosaurs. Not every state has a state dinosaur. But the ones that do, we're going to be ranking them. On a special tier list, just like the video game people do, you know? So join me. For that, we might even start the stream extra early tomorrow, like 11 a.m., something like that. We'll have to see. But stay tuned. Keep an eye on the Twitter page, I guess. I'll probably let you know what's going on there. But yeah, better include taste as a criterion. Taste? What do you mean, float? No, I'll be ranking them according to 
My view is a paleontologist. It's going to have to do a lot with, like, level of preservation, how much material is known, how special is this dinosaur, how well represented is it actually in that state, how historically important might it be, all that good stuff. So we'll be talking about that tomorrow for an extra special Saturday stream. But for now, let's go ahead and wrap things up here. There's our Deinonychus there to run our credits over. Yeah. Uh, come on, credits. You can do it. There we go. Don't go away just yet, everybody. We're going to do a massive raid and make somebody's day. So, uh, let's see. Who else is doing science right now? And we can go raid into them. Let's see. Sage is on. It's been forever since we've seen Sage. Let's go say hello to Rocket Sage. Uh, resident geologist here on Twitch. It's been a long time since I've seen one of her streams, so this is going to be really cool. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for this incredible stream today. Thank you for your patience as I was on hiatus. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your viewership. Thank you for your questions. Raiders, thank you for coming in here. Thank you, followers. I hope to see you maybe even tomorrow or on my usual weekday streams, five days a week. And thank you to everybody who supported this stream financially. I would not be able to do this if it were not for your incredible generosity. So thank you so, so much. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for your support. your enthusiasm. Thanks for believing in science outreach here on Twitch. It means a lot to me. We're going to go right into uh, Rocket Sage real quick. We'll say hello to Sage. Everybody, I hope to see you again tomorrow for a special weekend stream. Until then, you take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Stay curious. See you later.